Okay, thank you. Uh, we're a little bit late tonight since there are a few tornadoes, but uh, let it not be said that the planning board staff is unable to make it through, no matter what the elements, whatever they throw at us, we're here. So anyway, we're off and running here about 7.15. Our first item is a request for an amendment. This is on Chappaqua Crossing. It's a retail site plan, office parking management plan. So we have a request uh, in connection with um, uh, the applicant has asked for some relief from the requirement uh, to run the jitney. At this point, the understanding is that they were uh, required to run the jitney once the AFFH AFF -AF housing uh, was open and the CO was, uh, was granted. So they've asked for some relief. Apparently, the ridership is quite low, although I don't know if we have the numbers yet. Do you have those? No, I do not. Okay. So we understand, based on representation from the applicant, that ridership is very low. Uh, and they're asking for relief. The town board has passed a resolution granting 60 Temporary days. Temporary 30, 30 days. Yeah. 30 days, excuse me. So, Sabrina, maybe you can fill us in because you drew up the resolutions and worked uh, with the town board on this. So, ultimately, the, um, the applicant went to the town board. They submitted the letter that you have before you um, stating that they're uh, expending an, a lot of money to run a shuttle where they don't feel it's, it's an opportune time to run the shuttle. The Tropical Crossing site is under construction. Um, they, you know, are using a temporary school bus as the means to transport people. They would like to um, temporarily suspend the service. However, they have promised to um, arrange transportation for those that are using the shuttle or wish to use the shuttle so that they can get to where they need to go if they are counting on the shuttle. Um, we haven't received any details from the applicant about how they plan to do that. Um, but the town board is reluctant to, um, the, the town board approved the temporary suspension um, per communication with my office, provided the planning board was in support of the temporary suspension. Right. And I think there was a requirement that they needed to communicate this uh, to potential users as well. Correct. You know, yeah, there has, we there's a, there's this. several different processes right. that need to be put into place, and to date I have not received any information from them about this. The two-week period, the suspension, according to the town board resolution, would start on October 15th. And run for 30 days. 30 days to November 15th. Okay. This um, emanates from generally a condition in the 2015 <coughs> site plan approval for the retail, which talked about adoption of a parking management plan which address, among other things, Jitney service, didn't have any details um, in the resolution condition itself. The parking management plan was amended uh, as of um, November of 2015 to include the details that they're seeking relief from. I don't think we have a finally accepted parking management plan yet. So in terms of uh, if the board is willing to um, consider this request, uh, I have prepared a very, very short resolution which is essentially dovetails what the uh, town board adopted and um, ref reflects the fact that it, it is related to Condition 63 um, and that it will be the same 30-day period subject to the same conditions that the town board has imposed. And I have that. I right. Right. So in 30 days, does shuttle service automatically restart? Unless they get a further extension, which is contemplated uh, that, possibility. Yeah. And when did they start providing the shuttle service, and how did that dovetail with occupancy in the cupola building? Um, they started the shuttle service when they um, received the C of O for the cupola building to start occupying that building, which was at the beginning, I want to say April. And so do we know how many apartments were occupied at that time when they started it? Was it just a handful and now are they? When they started, it was, it was just a handful. Today, all of the, my understanding is that all of the workforce and all of the affordable units um, are occupied. Um, but I do not believe that all of the market rates are right. occupied. Um, you, you know, the, the site is under construction. It's very difficult and there's really nothing to go to the site for, um, and the site is really taking people from the site. So um, I, 
uh, I'm a I admit to being a little bit confused because I thought that the purpose of the shuttle service was to bring people to the Chappaqua Hamlet. Correct. Not bring people to the, the, the uh, Chappaqua Crossing retail. Correct. So um, their request uh, on their letter, it's the last paragraph, shuttle service until such time as a retail complex is 85% complete. Uh, what's the logic behind that thinking? I don't understand that. Do you have any idea? I do not. I, I, I can tell you, I had advised that the applicant provide a little bit more detail to us. I can tell you that um, the advertising for the shuttle has not um, been, I, I haven't seen any, um, you know, the, the schedule that has been produced was a schedule that was sent to everybody in this year's water billing. I would really like more information from them as to how they're marketing the existing shuttle, how they're working with tenants in the Cupola building. Yeah, see, I, I mean, I, I could see them asking for um, suspension until the residential is 85% complete because that's where their ridership is, is in the residential, it seems to me. Um, I've never been convinced that this was going to work anyway, but it's not up to me. And I, I think it's great that they're willing to go ahead and give it a shot. I think historically, Tom, it, um, when this provision came into being, <coughs> the applicant had just moved the 28 AFFH units into the Cupola building, but the Balter development was not on the horizon, and I think they just believed that there would be no great haste in building those 28 units so that they wouldn't be forced to implement this shuttle service anytime soon. And then boom. And that changed. Yeah. So that's kind of yeah. how we got here. And the town board is only granted, no matter what they've asked, the town board is only granted them 30 days with a right to come back. Yeah, well, uh, it, that seems fine to me. Do, do you have um, any idea when they say alternative transportation, do you know what that means? I mean, nope. somebody like call up and say, I want to ride? Do you know how I that don't works? know what they're talking, I have no sense of what they're going to propose for that. And do we have any sense of how ridership has changed as occupancy in the building has increased? I do not have any information. I mean, it could be that people are just starting to find out about it and just starting to tap into using it now that 40 some odd apartments or thereabouts are occupied in the, mm -hmm. in the cupola building. Correct. Sabrina, were they invited tonight? Yes. I mean, it's a little disturbing that they didn't give the detail and they didn't come. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you know, I would think that maybe what we would want to see is, okay, what's their alternative plan? I mean, and have they come and talk to us about what kind of outreach they've made to, to advertise the fact that this service is now in place before... All the things that Sabrina's asked for. Right. Yes. And I think, what, a week or so ago, right? You started asking after yes. the town board well, meeting. Well, and, and so the board is aware. I mean, one of the things that the town has been working diligently towards is trying to um, create a relationship with this applicant so the electric shuttle that the town received <coughs> from um, our, our NYSERDA grant could be utilized in place of a carbon shuttle. And we've been trying to come to agreement. You know, I know the town board has been working with the applicant. And, you know, there's, there's a great potential future for this use. But we haven't seen a lot of information from the applicant regarding promotion of this, how it relates to the tenancy in the buildings. Um, you know, so I've asked for the information. We haven't received it. And I, I think Tom has made a very important point by uh, uh, reminding us that this was all about the hamlet. This was as a result of the AKRF study on the hamlet, and it was really to support the Chappaqua hamlet. So this is a critical point. <clears throat> I think it's missed, frankly, in the town board's resolution, which only deals with the Chappaqua train station. Even the applicant talks in terms of the hamlet. So I guess, Russ, Les, you picked it up in your resolution where you've got the hamlet as well as the train station. I think that's critically important that we all remember that, that this is really not just a, a shuttle service down to the train station, but this was the result of that study and, again, trying to support one of our two hamlets. And that's memorialized in the latest draft of the parking yeah. So Tom's plan. point, I think, is critically important. Here. I, yeah, I thought it was, uh, act, I don't know if it was formally one of the conditions, <coughs> but I thought it was one of the conditions of zoning approval to do the retail that, that this be done because there was concern among 
the businesses downtown yeah. in the hamlet that yeah. they that they were going to suffer. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. So I, I think that's important to do, and I think that's why when they give us the information, it it should be uh, inclusive so it picks up those points. You know, not just a, a shuttle service at you know seven o'clock in the morning one time for the train station, but it's supposed to be supporting the hamlet. So I guess I don't have a problem with supporting the town board and echoing the town board right. uh, with our resolution uh, and let the town board figure out along with, with you, Sabrina, in terms of what they're going to do and what, what information they're going to supply. I will reach out to the applicant tomorrow morning pending the direction this board provides tonight as to following through on this. Do we need, um, I guess we need to approve this with a resolution? So we have before us a, um, a resolution that Les has prepared. Um, is there a motion to adopt the resolution? So moved. Second. Aye. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> we move now to our next item. This is the Ruben Yao uh, application for a subdivision amendment, lot line amendment approval, 66 Lawrence Farms Crossway and 76 Cary Lane. Is that rain that we hear? Is that the air conditioning or is that the roof blowing off? Don't worry about it. <laughs> if the roof was blowing off, we would know it. Say, say Les, yeah. if you're headed if you're headed in the Millwood direction. Which that's not, not much better. Oh. Some steel up there. I think that's why North Millwood's North all North messed North up North because all the north south roads there's over there are there's some sort of huge problem on Roaringbrook Road. I don't know what it is. <laughs> But Les, you are off the clock now. <laughs> Thank you, Les. <laughs> Good call. You're the only consultant who supplies sound effects. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah that's, good. that's good. That's good enough. Yep. Thank you. It's not real complicated. Yep. <clears throat> okay. After discussing this with the Rubens and what they wanted to do, you can see. Uh, can I borrow your pointer? Here's one. No, it doesn't work. Here's one. one. Um, after discussing it with them, mm -hmm. they they wanted to take this piece here because the whole reason behind this was that they they had oh, excuse me they had some fences that were there, and this is just to get back what they thought there was back, their backyard, and supposedly Mr. Yao right here, and when he signs the maps and everything, you'll know that he totally approves of what they're doing. Uh, you know, I don't talk to Mr. Yao, but they do. And they have to make this, but that's all they want to do. It's a, and what they did is, I was talking to them about it. And we decided that would be the most regular mm -hmm. thing we could do. So, 
so it returns what they thought was always their backyard and also remedies a non-conforming situation, right? Yeah. Correct. Okay. It's far more regular this time than the last time we saw it. Okay. It's not a nose yes. anymore. Yep, right. <laughs> how did, uh, do, do you know what the, the history is? This, how old is this house? How did that get built in, a, in, the, in the rear yard? Do you, do you have any idea? Okay. It's a classic flag line. Huh? It is what it is. Yep. Okay. Right. Sabrina, you got some uh, questions or points? Um, there were a couple of amendments that or yeah, amendments to the plans that still need to be made. They will be made. They're all, I looked at all of them. They're all fine. There's no problem at all. Well, one, one, um, one point for the board's um, note is that there's an area, um, given the lot line change, you can see where the where if you want to highlight Michael the area note further down, down. if you want to give me that pointer I'll do it yeah, um, be easier. yeah. you gotta squeeze it I don't know why <coughs> so this area from this line here down to this line here the area within here cannot be counted towards the minimum lot area requirement for the house on this lot and it doesn't meet with um, the code required standards mm -hmm. so it does not affect the existing property whatsoever but it's for the note of record that that area is taken out of the minimum lot area calculations for coverage and all the other things as well correct correct okay it's hard to work um, other than that um, you know the the comments that I had provided um, is squaring up the, the building coverage and the development coverage, putting North Arrow on the plan, so on and so forth. Um, so there's a list of 17 comments, um, two of which um, relate to secret is an unlisted action in accordance with the State Environmental Quality Review Act. Uh, we included a negative declaration for your review. Um, and if everything's okay with that, we can move forward. Okay, very good. Okay, any questions, comments? Tom Schoen? Uh, if not, is there a motion to adopt the uh, NAIC deck that's been prepared? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. And then the other issue is whether we wish to waive jurisdiction on this. Uh, in the past, we've done that, and it seems to me that this would be an appropriate time to waive jurisdiction. I don't think there are any major issues here, or any issues really of our and concern. So is there a motion to waive jurisdiction on this? Can I ask a question sure. real quick? Sure. If, um, if this area, because I guess it's because it's too narrow. Correct. It needs to be a minimum of 200 feet wide. So that would be true for this area also for this lot. Yeah, this little Correct. peninsula up here. Right. It's just, we have a huge area. And clearly that is no problem because lot number one is quite large. The only thing I, I would suggest, this is not really going to make a difference in what we do, but we might one day end up with an application to put a swimming pool back here now that there's room for it, but that's neither here nor there, I think. So I, I have no comments. Okay. So would you uh, second the uh, second the wave, waiver? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, very good. Thank you. Resolution. Yeah. We oh, we have a resolution even though we're yes. waiving it? Okay. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not waiving the resolution part. You're waiving okay. jurisdiction. Okay. And the, the resolution simply says that, you know, be it hereby resolved that you're waiving, waiving your jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. And also all and the other points are now incorporated. That that need to be made. All the changes, everything. Prior to the okay. the plan. Oh, well. Is there a motion to adopt? You just can't let go. Well, no, I do so. The motion is being the adoption of the resolution. But okay. You can change the motion to be the adoption of the resolution. Sure. And it'll well, cover everything. I mean, whatever, whatever folks want to do. <laughs> Have another resolution to Let's adopt make the resolution. Okay, very good. A motion to adopt the resolution. Yes. Yeah, Sheila just made that resolution. <laughs> That's the motion. Is it second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Did we limp through that? <laughs> Sometimes the simplest tasks <laughs> become Herculean. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Okay. We move now to our next item. That's the uh, Chappaqua Central School District. This is an application for a preliminary subdivision plat, tree removal permit, steep slopes permit, stormwater pollution prevention plan approvals. This is on Button Hook Road and Gary Lane. Hello, good evening. Um, first thing is Jerry Barrett, who is really our point person on this, is on his way over 120 coming from Armonk. Okay. So he's dodging some trees, so he may be another five or ten minutes before he gets here. Um, that's why we wait. Are you here for the Millwood uh, veterinarian uh, application? Me, no. Okay. Is anyone here for the veterinarian application? He thought he wouldn't be here till 8.30. Well, that's um, not good. <laughs> two minutes. I think he's in the dead zone. I couldn't reach him by phone, but he was we heading over. We can do over, the so fire extension request. Sure, we can do that in, I guess, minutes. Why don't we do that and wait for Jerry? Okay, thanks. Okay. I'll keep in touch. Right? Yep. Okay. We'll jump ahead. We have uh, a request from the um, uh, Newcastle Fire District Number 1 for an extension request. This is for their subdivision, uh, resubdivision plat, lot merger, waiver of jurisdiction, site development plan, tree removal permit, stormwater pollution prevention plan, 491, 495 King Street, New York Route 120 and Elm Street. So um, somewhere in here we have our request for an extension and I believe uh, Jennifer and Sabrina and Bob, you don't have any issues with this, right? They've indicated that they're moving along. We've all seen that they've taken down the other building. Um, and so is there a motion then to grant the extension that they request? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I see Jerry just walked in the back, but we can sneak in a couple of minutes just to stay warm here. <clears throat> I don't know if we can, uh, we have to be careful here and make sure we're all here. Um, for these appropriate minutes because we're missing Michael Allen, of course. Well, the first one, we, uh, we can't. it's only you and I. Yeah, so I don't think we can do that. So okay. July 1, we can't do. Uh, we can do July 18. Okay. I had uh, one small change on page 5. Okay. Line 57. Uh, but when it came to the possibility of cannibalizing the town's existing hamlets, not much quantitative information had been provided. Okay. Where, where are you? Line 57 on page, fifth, page 5 of 6, line 57. Um, but when it came to the possibility of cannibalizing the town's existing hamlets, does it make a difference? I'm sorry, what did you say? No, I just said how appropriate that we're talking about that oh. we're approving these events tonight. Yep. Anything else? Okay, with that change, is there a motion to adopt uh, the minutes of July 18? Yeah, Almost this is this fair is, to say, 2014. Tom, you seem to you seem to have a problem. Well, this is four years ago. <laughs> we're finally remember. caught up. I can't remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> As I told I Janice, I, I'm just glad that we're all still alive. I, I yeah. just I just <laughs> to be it here to approve them. I, I don't remember. I plead advancing uh, dementia. I don't remember any of this. So I'm going to have to. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to stop the process. Certainly, <laughs> I don't want to see these again. Should I just so. not make the change then? I mean, it, it doesn't. Oh, it's up to you. Yeah, no. Just, Was there a motion to adopt the? the yeah, with the change. As amended. Yeah, yeah, as amended. We have one change. That's fine. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, let's try July 21. Do we have? Yeah, we can do that. This was a special meeting. Any uh, any amendments on this? No. Nope. Not. Is there a motion to adopt the July 21, 2014 minutes? So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, second. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Okay. Okay, September 2nd, 2014. Uh, we can take, we can adopt these. Nope. I have no changes. Okay. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes of September 2nd, 2014? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I think we can do one more in 2014. Yeah, September 8th. We can do this. Any changes? No. Nope. Is 
there a motion to adopt the minutes of September 8, 2014? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We can do 2017. And we'll call Jerry up. Um, any changes on the minutes of uh, November 8, 2017? No, not, not me. Okay. If not, is there a motion to adopt? Just finished flipping through now. Okay. I haven't had any changes. Okay. Either. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes of November 8, 2017? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Well, that was entertaining, so we're ready for you now, Jerry. It's always something to look forward to. We can return to those later on. So uh, we'll call it again. This is the, uh, the Chappaqua Central School District application for a preliminary subdivision plan, tree removal permit, steep slopes permit, stormwater pollution prevention plan approvals. This is on Button Hook Road and Gary Drive. I'm here uh, this evening um, with uh, Randy Katches, uh representing the uh, Chapel School District. I believe John Chow is here as well from the school district. Colleen McCall. Okay, and uh, engineers Bill Beckman and Michael Campbell are also here. Uh, so we were last before this board with this project in 16. And at that point, we had gone through um, quite a few versions of the plan until we got to the point where I think the board felt comfortable with the plan and we were directed to go do our engineering. So what happened was the soil testing began and uh, Campbell Engineering started first, went and found the septic areas, pretty much the areas that we thought they were going to be working in. Um, they had to move one septic on lot one and we'll get there as soon as Randy can go to view and rotate. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to do that now. Up to up there. Okay, rotates on top. And just keep, just, just keep going. And uh, so what the, the first plan, this plan was filed with the planning board for the May 30th uh, filing date. Uh, we were going to come and talk to the planning board in June, but it was determined that some of our information was not quite uh, up to snuff and uh, it was determined that the best thing to do was to go back and work out some of our engineering um, so we can uh, uh, come back with uh, maybe just move that coffee cup and I think you're good. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the plan you see on the top is the, two, is the 2016 plan is the plan that the planning board had seen and um, you know I, I, again we've got the 1600 uh, uh, lineal foot uh, uh, cul-de-sac. We've got six lots. Um, and what happened was, um, as a result of the soil testing, uh, Campbell Engineering went first, did found their locations for their uh, septic areas, uh, got the soils that would work, had the health department out there, um, got everything settled. Once they were done, um, uh, WSP Engineering followed up with the soil, with the soil testing for the stormwater systems and there's setbacks that they had to maintain between the septics and all that kind of thing so they had to go through so it was quite a rigorous process we lost the weather we had to continue that into 17 so finally they got it um, so the, the, the things that changed uh, the, the things that changed on the plans and it's I think you'll you'll see that it's not uh, it's, it's, it's not sig significant. For instance, lot one, what happened on lot one was the septic, it was originally proposed here, um, it didn't work. The shallow bed, bedrock, the septic had to be moved to this area here. Um, other than that, the layout was the same. Um, lot two, uh, pretty much the septic got larger. What they, what they found, what the engineers found in terms of soil testing, that uh, the site is controlled by shallow bedrock, um, uh, and what, what happened was the septics all got larger, the stormwater management areas, they all got larger. Um, in the end, we ended up having to disturb an additional two acres of, of, uh, of land area that previously we, we didn't. But uh, as we will come full circle, that we were able to increase as a net net, when we're all done, we increased our open space, protected space 
by 1.7 acres over this plan. So this was the first plan, um, but again, we had a protected area that was just in the back in in the in the circumference. At this time, the protected area is going to include all of these fingers going up between the lots. I know Mr. Coleman was concerned that he liked those wildlife corridors in between those. Plus, it'll help create that established look of the neighborhood. These areas will be protected. Uh, there's not going to be any activity allowed in there other than normal maintenance. Um, so uh, septic area got bigger, pretty much the same layout in lot two. Lot three, pretty much the same layout. Um, but again, you can see the septic area is here, and you can see how much bigger it got. When you see these septics, this means primary, this means res reserve. So the dotted area would represent the primary, and the uh, the, the clear area is the, the, the reserves. You could, we had to adjust some of the lot, lot lines. For instance, lot two, the septic had to shift over into lot three, so we had to adjust the lot lines. Um, on lot four, uh, we ran into some trouble. We had to change the approach because the septic area ended up being here. And so what we had to do is we had to change the approach to the side. Otherwise, it's, it's the same layout. We just moved the driveway to the side to allow the septic area to be uh, in the front yard. Um, lot five, it's pretty much the same layout as you see, except again, the septic area got larger. And lot six is pretty much the same. So uh, it's substantially the same plan, except we had to make adjustments to get the engineering to work. So with that, I'll go into the current plan. So you can exit out of that. submission and then I would go down to the um, SP1 existing conditions plan try counter this time um, so the existing conditions plan um, it just shows you know what, what what's out there where all the the trees are where it's located in the R1A zone um, I think Randy uh, Randy we can move right into the site plan because it's very difficult to see this plan at, at this scale so the next one would be the zoning conformance plan and what we had done is we had gone through on the plan and we had gone lot by lot, and we've we've worked out the zoning con conformance chart and the development coverage chart. We have color coded everything, and the the bottom line is we have a zoning compliant layout for this for this zone. Uh, next one. Site plan. So this is the site plan um, that it is substantially the same plan that you just saw on the comparative plan, except obviously it's been tuned up a little bit. It, it's been it's been finalized. Um, all the lots are pretty much the same. The layouts, uh, primary septic. These are the homes. These are the pools and the cabanas. These are the driveways. This is the road. Um, septic areas the, the is the prime primary with the reserve and that happens on each one of the lots and you could faintly see uh there's all the stormwater and bill beckman will talk more about the stormwater but bill has worked uh through the entire site he's provided dry wells and storage vaults on each lot um, that uh, discharge to level spreaders. Um, he's provided uh, a, a, a infiltration basin, a water quality basin, a, a detention basin. Um, he's been working very closely uh, with the town engineer. Uh, there's a lot of back and forth on that, and hopefully we're on track with that, I hope. And we're getting closer. Uh, so what happened with, with, with this plan was everything you see in green now is protected space. So this is like a 20-acre site. 10 acres of that are going to be in protected space. That's going to be managed by the Homeowners Association. They'll, we have to develop the language of what will be allowed in there and what, and what won't be al allowed in there. But pretty much half of the site is going to be in permanent protected green space. Um, so each one of the lots will uh, 
you know, will will be buffered by their their neighbors. We are still taking all of the stone walls that have to come out, and we're going to line the front of every every lot is going to be lined in the front uh, with stone walls to get the established look. Um, we have saved as many trees in the front yards as we can to get these houses pushed back. Um, and when we get to the tree replacement plan, you'll see that I think we're planting 500 and some odd trees. So I think pretty much we can make this look pretty much established right off the, right off the bat. Um, there's been discussion um, about this lot that has all the stormwater management areas, and I believe it's probably going to be part of lot six. This would be lot six here. It's probably going to take over that whole lot, but obviously it's going to have to be shared by the HOA on, on the on the maintenance and all that will be developed. There'll be um, there'll there'll be uh, concrete monuments. It's kind of off here, but it's the concrete monumentation, 25 feet on center on all these fingers. And they'll be marked a conservation area or a protected area. And then it'll be 50 foot centers everywhere else. So it could always be monitored and enforced if there's been any clearing beyond those lines. Um, uh, so I think we could move on to the next plan. One of the things we were asked to look at also was could we not build the septic reserve areas? And we studied that. Um, I talked with Michael Campbell about it, and uh, I believe Michael explained it to me that the health department can allow you to not build the septic reserve area if there's a good reason not to, and if you have access to get to it at a later date. Um, some of the criteria that Michael explained to me was that the I think there has to be like we're 15 feet past the last trench at about a 15 percent slope. You have to carry that down before you can start your one on three slope down. So what was happening is when we, we, we have grading studies to show it, if this was your last trench, your next con your, your top of slope before you try to slope down is 15 feet away. And then you got to go to one and by three. So what we found was when we graded each one of these out, because each one of these septic systems has three and a half feet of fill on it. And by the time for, you do that, all, you're for all six, all six, um, bedrock controlled site, um, uh, maybe three, four feet of soil. I think they found pretty much throughout. Is that about right, Bill? Um, and uh, so what we found was that we were grading pretty much halfway into the reserve areas. You'd be suffocating the trees. Um, so, you know, maybe we were going to save one or two trees or I think maybe even six trees, but it you know, you can't get to some of these areas. You'd never get to get it, get back here. Um, the only one that we think it's possible to do is this one because you've got great access. It's right off of the driveway. So this reserve area, we think, does not have to be saved. It uh, does not have to be built, and we'll make application for that. But we pretty much have determined that the rest of them will probably have to be built because you're not going to really save anything. And to try to get to them later is going to have, you know, you have a finished landscape, and to try to get to them later, it just doesn't make any sense. You have pretty good access, don't you, on lot number four? The septic is in the front. Yeah, but I think on lot number four, on lot number four, we were going to preserve one tree. So we're not going to build it for one tree. It seems that it would make sense just to just to get it over with. Okay. You're only going to save one tree. Lot number one, you might have saved three three trees, but access is horrible. Lot number two, you'd okay. save two trees. Access is horrible. Lot number three, you could potentially save six trees in this area, but the access again is horrible. Lot number four, you're correct. You've got good access, but you only save one tree. Lot number five, you'd save two trees, bad access. Lot number six, you could save seven trees with good access. So we we're kind of resolved. Lot number six, that's the one we should ask the waiver for. If you flipped the primary and the reserve on lot six, would that make it easier to get to the reserve if you have to build it later on? Well, I think, Michael, do you always like to build the uphill one first? Yeah, but you, you, even if you switch them and you say, okay, let's do it this way, you're still going to have trouble getting there, period, no matter what. You're still going to have six. There, well, six. On six. That's I'm just talking about six. six. Well, but, but you see, with three and a half feet of fill, you would still have to start filling from the top. I so. so, you know, we, we couldn't just, otherwise you'd have this, you'd go down and you'd have this weird bump in the yard. Um, so that really wouldn't work. Steve, do you agree with those those figures in terms of the uh, net savings of, of trees? Yes. Um, 
So this is our tree removal plan. One of the things, um, Randy, can you go to, uh, sure. one of the things that uh, Steve had re reviewed the plan thoroughly and, and asked us to look at about 90 additional trees that were on the edges of the clearing and grading limit line. Um, go back, Randy. We're going to go back. Which one? We're going we're gonna to get out of this. Oh. We're going to close out of this. And uh, they were on the clearing and grading limit line, and he requested, you know, if we went back to, uh, where's our, where's your drive? Here? Your thumb drive? You got to get this. Let's that. go. Oh, there you go. Remove this. Got it. There you go. Okay, uh, that one. The bottom one. This one? Yeah. You got it. And, uh, you know, if we went back and looked at those 90 trees that were on the edges of the clearing and grading limit line, could we adjust the grading? Could we add tree wells uh, to try to save some trees? So we went and we looked through that and to see what we could possibly do. And what we found was that, yes, that was possible on, uh, on several of these. And we went through that and, you know, we found on lot one, we were able to save, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven extra, extra trees. And, you know, we went through each lot to see what we could save. And in the end, we were able to save an additional 29 trees by, by doing that. Um, so when we did get to the tree removals, we went through the tree removal. Uh, the tree removals, we tallied everything up. And what we did was we, uh, we separated it to the native trees and to the invasive trees. And what we found was that the native tree caliper inches subject to replacement would be 1156 inches you divide that by two and a half inches per tree that would be 462 replacement trees for native trees that would have to be replaced we also um, calculated uh, the invasive tree caliper inches subject to replacement for the invasive ones that was 360 caliper inches divided by two and a half for one tree that's 144 replacement trees so what we came up with was that we were going to have to replace 607 trees at two and a half inch caliper. Um, and what we've gone then is, and, and, and we've broken that down. There's the protocols that uh, let the new tree, uh, the true new tree reg legislation, it actually helped us because it, what changed has that the tree cal, the existing trees that are out there from seven inches, or I think it's seven inches to 17 inches. Now, they're only subject to replacement at 25%, where the 17, 18 inches and up is 50%. Prior to this, it was 50% for everything. So it, right. it actually helped us since the last time. And then, of course, once we have our tree protocols, the replacement ratios that, you know, we did, um, I don't exactly can remember, I think we had, you know, 50% of them were canopy trees and another 25% understory trees and then the other 25% in, 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 in shrubs. Um, so we can go to that, uh, the tree replacement plan, and the tree replacement plan is actually, now you got to go back to the plan set, okay. Randy. Yeah. The submission. And uh, tree replacement plan, good. Yeah. SB4 first. That's all right, that's, that's, that's fine. Right. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Janice. Um, you want to, uh, you want to go back? No, that's good. We can start there. Okay. And this is uh, I think you got to keep. see it so small. You have to rotate your it's upside. Your upside okay. down. All right. Nope. So what we did was we blew this up to a larger scale. I don't know what, what happened. There we go. Okay. We blew this up to a larger scale. We broke the site into two in, in, into two areas. We've got lots one through three, and then we have lots three three through six on the on, on the next page. And you know we've we've had to site you know 500 plus trees. Um, and so what we did was we went along the buffer to the neighbor and we tried to plant that very heavily that would be a mixture of trees and shrubs to get a very dense hedgerow going on in there um, we've planted um, you know all in these front yards we've also went in with the understory trees and we went into these understories to plant things like you know dogwood and hornbeam that would be understory trees when you get out into the open yard areas it, it would be maples and, and, and oak and uh, hickory that type of thing 
And so we went through that, and as you can see, it's, it's quite a dense planting. Um, the red, I believe, when you see these red things, uh, I think what that is, don't be confused by that, that is the uh, deer netting that will have to go around the, around the shrub masses. Um, we just, what we try to do is we do try to do eight to ten shrubs and we try to create masses and keep it one species so it looks, it doesn't look mixed up. Um, and so that's what you're seeing with the red, so don't be confused by that. Um, but when we had gone through this and we have the same thing and we went, we have the, it's all native uh, species and uh, we went lot by lot and we list the major trees and we list the understory trees and we list the shrubs and then we quantify the whole thing and um, that's kind of how we came up with this whole thing. We also have a, a separated planting plan for, for the stormwater basins and, and what we'll be doing at, at the basins. But one of the uh, things in the new tree legis legislation that came up was that the planning board has the ability to um, reduce the requirement for replacements for, uh, for the invasive trees. And uh, we looked at this, so, you know, I think we said the invasive trees, we had to replace 144 trees. So we had requested in our letter to the planning board that they consider a 50% reduction or instead of 144 trees to replace the uh, invasive trees to be re removed, 72 trees. And what we did was we went through and uh, we, we discussed this at our staff meeting. We, we met every other uh, week with, with staff and they asked us to show, well, what trees would you ask the planning board to not install? So we went through and all these trees you see that are grayed out. And, and primarily we did it along this border here because again, you've got this big open space area here that's kind of wet and will probably never be developed. There's no neighbors down there. As opposed to here, we kept all these trees because there are neighbors and we want to get that really heavy. So, you know, they're all inside here. So all the trees, and again, you know, to get 535 trees on the site is, is, is a challenge. That's a lot of trees. And so it, it's the areas that you see um, where we have these, uh, these grayed out trees and again most of them are going to be in the understory or at the edges or adjacent to the undeveloped lot and Randy can we just go to the next plan sure. no 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 you're right six This is just a continuation, uh, as you can see, of what, uh, you know, of, 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 you know, lots three through, this is lots four, five, and six, and it's kind of the same, uh, it, it, it's the same concept. We're going to plant in the front yards as much as we can. Of course, we've got to stay away from the septic areas. We can't plant over there, but we can plant around them. Uh, we can't plant in the town's right of way, so we're staying out of that. Um, and you know, so we're trying to get trees where we think we can, and in between, you know, we're filling in. And, you know, once these, once once these wooded areas are cl are cleaned out of the brush and the deadfalls, and you know, we'll go in there and we'll plant with the with the other trees, with the other understory trees and, and, and shrubs to thicken up those buffers. But once again, part of those 72 trees where we're requesting the waiver are these great gray trees, and you know, we 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 feel that they probably really won't be missed. Can we go back? To, um I had a question for you on lots one, two, and three, where you've got that planting plan up against your, your western border and the eastern border of, of your neighbors. You know, by installing such a very thick planting barrier, um, I'm concerned that you're going to impose, um, you know, an awful lot of shade and block sun, especially morning sun, uh, to your neighbors. So by maybe we should look at that area and remove some trees out of that area. Maybe it's just too thick. Maybe we should also use more shrubs down there instead of trees. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm concerned about, you know, removing, you know, people's access to sun, whether it's for solar reasons or other reasons. I'm sorry, can we get to that plant so we can look at it? Yeah, that was the one just before this. It was lots Excuse one, two, and three. Sure, sure. Because it looks like it's right up against the, the, the we, property we, line. Right? And, we, um, we are, but, you know, it's, it's interesting when you're out there because it's, it's kind of like this. We're up here, 
and then you get to the property line and it starts dropping it down. It drops to, off very to, severely. To, to the yes. neighbors. And that whole area is wooded. So the yep. neighbors, the homes are really developed closer to Gary Drive. They're really not up there. So I'm not sure that it would affect them, but we could certainly look, yeah. look, uh, look, look at it. If you could see where the... What area are you talking about? Right here. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. I don't see it. It's coming back. <laughs> it's stars. It's a star night. But yeah, right here. Yeah, okay. Sure. Got it. But right on the property. Yeah. You know, we could certainly do that. We could certainly add more shrubbery to create that thick buffer because this this is really all wooded. Yeah. Because it drops down, and when you get yes. to the backyards, that's where that's where their yards are. So it's almost carved out. Do you think it was carved out when the other the Gary Lane uh, it may well uh, rows, been. Uh, yeah. houses were put in? Yeah. yeah when, okay. they, when, the, when they when they built the difference, right? Yes. So yeah, this this site is really up on like a plat plateau. Yes, yes. But because it's up there, I think even the, the you know putting the trees right on the property line and with that kind of density actually accentuates that kind of concern. Yeah, well, I think probably it's a good idea to use the understory trees and more shrubbery because it'll create more of a tra transition from right. you know being open to straight up. It, it'll create that transition. So yeah, we can certainly okay. do, do, do that, and I'm sure we can still make all the numbers work. Um, and as long as we have this up here, I'm stealing a little bit of uh, Bob's thunder, but one of the concerns or questions I have for you is we're, we're building these detention ponds here. And you've indicated that the soils are very, very thin. We have a lot of bedrock. Uh, we have had so many issues over the years where people say that whenever a new development goes in, it disturbs the soil, disturbs the runoff, and then all of a sudden their basements are wet. So what kind of assurance are we going to have here that this water is going to go into the ground and you've, yet you've indicated it's bedrock so we have uh, not much ground for it to go into. You know, the concern here is that we have runoff coming off that very steep uh, area that we have and we're digging down and now we have uh, impacts to these neighbors and, you know, we hear, again, basements are wet and we never had this before and what are we doing? It seems to me that we're, we're putting a lot of, we're putting our water here. And uh, it makes a lot of sense from the standpoint of engineering, but my concern is what the impacts might be to those neighbors. Now, Bill, you had done you had done soil testing on these to to, to confirm that that uh, those things would would drain, correct? Oops. <laughs> 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 Just Bill, Bill Beckman. Yes, we did uh, infiltration tests for all the places where we're planning to put infiltration structures into the ground. The soils are uh, very receptive to infiltration. Uh, there's a considerable distance uh, from the basins to the adjacent homes, so that gives a chance for the water to get down into the ground, into the into the bedrock system. Uh, but you also got to remember too is that we're really Putting water into the ground, which is already going into the ground initially, uh, we're, we're doing is taking the water from the new impermeable services and putting it into the ground. Otherwise, it was going into the ground. Well, my concern is that you, you've indicated you only have three feet of, of, of soil, and uh, how far how far can it go into the ground if we have bedrock underneath it? So, my concern is that you're going to dig this hole, and then we're just going to have sheet runoff uh, below the surface. And and I would disagree. I think some of these, based on the map. You know, this lot right here where we have most of the water is actually, the house is right about here. It's actually Pretty fairly close. close. Yeah. So um, I, I'm not saying it can't be engineered, but it is a concern because we have heard this so many, many times. When you put a development in, you guys approved it, and now my basement's wet. It never happened before. Yeah, and, and you said that um, you're putting water in the ground when it's already going into the ground, but it's not going into the ground now and the concentrations you're talking about here you've got this the, the road is essentially the the high point the ridge right. and you're taking water from the other side of the ridge where the lots are through these catch basins um, and draining it into that's the purpose of this so you're accumulating accumulating a lot more water on the other side of that ridge than you otherwise are now well unless I'm mistaken not, not to a large degree because there's a the, the property sits on a north-south trending ridge, mm -hmm. and you can only push so much drainage across a high point uh, until the point where you try to do any more, <laughs> and you get this elevation change that doesn't work. So uh, when I get to my presentation, you'll see the sort of dividing line on north-south, and it pretty much stays the same. Uh, well, you've got all these roofs are going over there. But the, not all of them, and again, the, 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 the water that's falling on the roofs is now falling on the ground and running off the same direction. 
Okay, we'll, we'll wait for your presentation. Yeah, it's not going that way. Well, it, it looks like it is, but that's we'll wait for your presentation. Well, you know, and, and you know, to your point, Mr. Chairman, maybe what Bill can do is consider when we build this to consider a a a clay trench, a clay mm -hmm. bar barrier, right. to maybe stop that from right. from wanting to hit that that rock exactly and, yeah. and start running down. So yeah, I think there's ways to. to yeah, I'm sure there are ways to engineer it, but uh, I I think we're going to need some kind of assurance on that point. Obviously, leave it to Bob, but you know. Uh, as a layperson, it, it was a concern, and a layperson who reads the letters that come in complaining about us. Yeah, I'm a layperson who has a wet basement, so. <laughs> <laughs> and he's Lots miles away from here, so he doesn't <laughs> want to be impacted. <laughs> I'm very concerned. Uh, Randy, I hate to make you get up again. No, it's okay. Um, I just want to uh, quickly go through some of the other. Um, so, uh, the tree replacement plan we did, why don't we go up to um, R1, roadway layout and profile. And so we have um, worked with Campbell Engineering and the town engineer to detail how everything is getting built and to demonstrate that um, you know, all the driveways and the roadways can meet all the vertical and horizontal geometry re re required. And uh, it's it's a fairly gentle site. So, uh, you know, what you can see is this dotted line represents the existing grade. And you can see the proposed grade. So we pretty, pretty much run the entire road pretty much on grade. I think our maximum slope is 8%, which is a handicap ramp. So it, well, pretty gentle grades um, the, 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 the entire way. Uh, we still have some um, crossing of the T's and the dotting of the I's to to, to make sure that the town engineer is, is satisfied that everything's been, been addressed. But things like site distances and uh, driving distances and, and all these types of things, we, we've, we've looked through all that. That's been kind of hashed out, and that's in the process of being finalized now. Um, Randy, let's go on to the next one. Here? Yeah. So what, uh, you know, what we were asked to do, we were asked to look at, uh, you know, to make sure that there were clear lines of sight as people were pulling out of their driveways. Of course, this reads a lot better on the plan than it does on a, on a screen. But, you know, each driveway, uh, it, it does have clear sight lines for about 200 feet <coughs> each, each way. We have profiles to go with each one. Um, if you, we can go to the next one, Randy. Um, I think one of the concerns the town engineer had was whether we were going to need any easements over adjacent properties where these sight lines will happen and that is the case uh, where we have the point of curvature on the road and you know these folks coming out of lot five for instance as they look down the road to see what's coming they're going to be looking across and they say you know conversely this guy traveling here he's going to be looking over here uh, this is the property line where our stone wall is our stone wall is low enough that you can look over it but <coughs> they will be looking across the yard here they will be looking across a part of the yard here and, and a part of the yard here so there will have to be site easements um, put together in favor of the town i believe yes. uh, in case they have to be <coughs> will review site easements uh, just to make sure that they're clear um, and let's see, Randy, I, 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 you let's look at the exercise you're getting. Uh, driveway profile, same thing. Um, you'll see, you know, pretty much they're, they all pretty much, you know, gentle grades. Um, you know, we have a little bit of cut and fill going on with, you know, how we're, we're doing it, but pretty much it's, it's, it's pretty balanced. We pretty much are following the grades. Uh, pretty much the whole way. Uh, it's like I said. Once you're up there, it's a plateau. It's it, it's all pretty gentle. And I think the last plan we had developed was the uh, preliminary utility plan. And that plan is also still being worked. Uh, I know Michael is still working on the on the water main uh, study, but the utility plan. Um, and uh, we're still waiting for our surveyor to update the survey to pick up the area utilities, catch basins, whatever's out there in, in, in the street. We're still waiting for that to happen. Can uh, I say one thing, Jerry, yeah. about the sight lines? have to be based on 30 MPH because I, 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 25 I, I, is only approved by the board based on consideration yeah. by the police chief. Yeah. But all the new roads that go in are always 30. Okay. 
So if we have to adjust it, we'll, Mike will be checking it. Um, and if we got to adjust it, we'll adjust it. But I, I think we tried to be conservative when we were doing these things. Oh, you used 200, but you might have to adjust some for the gradient, yeah. which might increase it 5, 10 feet. Yeah. I, I think on the dynamic, it was, I think it, it was like 180. Plus, the eye height has to be consistent throughout. can't have 425 on. At least the dri I, driver's eye height has to be the same for both the approaching vehicle right. and the car in the driveway. Three two five. Three point five not three. We'll adjust it. Easy, it'll, it, easily it'll add a little bit more too. You have to tweak that. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's. I, I think it's all. It's all going to work. Um, mm. Well, what we found was um, pretty much as you're driving down, your view pretty much stays within the right of way. It's not like we have hard Enjoy. corners, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's pretty clear. Uh, but I think what we uh, what what we're showing on this plan, and of course it doesn't read very well in uh, for some reason when it gets to this, but I think what Michael is proposing to do is run the water main up the middle of the road. I think his he would have preferred to keep it on the side of the road. I wouldn't recommend it up the middle. Jerry Morshall will never allow that because during installation and repairs, you're right in the middle of the travel lanes. Don't you want you need to have your distance from catch basins? Michael, you need to come up to the microphone. Yeah, yeah, good. And wasn't it? Also, I'm coming. <laughs> and wasn't it also that he didn't like cake before, either? Before before you do the submittal, all I can say, before you do the submittal to the county, please meet with Mr. Morshell. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> no chance of losing that. Uh, remind me, uh, we, we've seen so many iterations on this. Um, is this now a conventional or a conservation uh, conventional? Okay, so we're we're kind of stuck with this uh, road width. I mean, I'm hearing this 30 miles an hour. It's a 1,600 foot long road. I'm wondering, do we need a highway here? But okay. So, you know, this this will be tweaked. I know Michael's still working with it. I know he's he's fighting back and forth whether he can. He's got the K Creek issue or the middle of the road issue. Um, it was complicated. I know he was going back and forth with the highway superintendent on that. Um, <laughs> but you know, the the electric and uh, telephone would be on one side of the road, and you know, stormwater and, and and septic. So it's pretty much roughed out, um, but it still needs to be finalized. Um, so that kind of goes through the site plan package. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know Bill wanted to talk a little bit about the stormwater, unless there's any questions before we move on. Any questions, Tom, um, Sheila, Jerry? Okay. A lot of work tonight. That's <laughs> one. Are you driving yourself there? Because your device is not recognized. I don't know. What? We have one of the reports today. Someone. It's working. It's working. All right. Do huh? you want to try? All right. Uh, again, my name is Bill Beckman. Uh, my role in this project was to develop the plan for managing uh, stormwater and uh, runoff from the uh, proposed development. Uh, we have two project, primary project objectives to uh, resolve and, and meet. One was to satisfy the town's requirements, and the other is to satisfy the New York City Department of Environmental Protection requirements. The town requirements basically are summed up by no increase in runoff, uh, rate or volume leaving the property. Uh, New York City DEP requirements, uh, because we're in the New York City watershed, we need to meet the requirements of their water quality quantity calculations, which addresses both rate of increase, rate of flow, volume, and also provides for enhanced phosphorus removal for improving the runoff quality. 
Uh, as Jerry mentioned, the process involved uh, communication and a number of meetings with town staff, uh, town engineer in particular, and uh, the review at various stages was very helpful and the board should uh, understand and recognize that uh, their assistance has been appreciated. Uh, okay, Jerry, if you go to figure two. I'm jumping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to go to the figures. If you just minimize that, because it'll come back. Go to figures at the bottom. One more, one more, one more. There. Nope. Next one down. Yep. And then uh, just move to the second figure. Now hit the arrow to go down. Yeah, one more. Okay. That one there. Okay, this, this particular figure is just uh, basically shows the existing topographic conditions for the property. We're looking at 20.55 acres. Uh, as Jerry mentioned, moderate uh, slopes on the property. And currently, the existing cover on the entire property is, is woods. Uh, in the, this particular evaluation, the, like I said, the ridge center line moves up through the property, sort of along that heavy dark line. Um, and to get better definition and uh, look at the effects within the, the development itself, we broke it down into 12 sub drainage areas, again, all outlined by the heavy dark lines. Um, they're shown on this particular figure. And of note is we aligned the drainage areas on the western side of the property to correspond with the property boundaries uh, for the lots adjacent to us so we could look at the runoff increases or decreases for each particular lot uh, relative to what's coming <coughs> off our property. On the eastern side, it was uh, set up more with the topographic control and the design points uh, there, there are fewer of them, uh, and we're heading down into the undeveloped uh, wetland area on the uh, east side of the property. Uh, using the HydroCAD uh, model, we analyzed the runoff for the 1, 2, 5, 10, 25, 50, 100 year storm for these existing conditions. All right, if you can go to the pro one down below. That's good. Okay, this shows existing or proposed conditions. Here, the sort of the tan uh, coloration shows the remaining woods surface cover. The the green is would be lawn areas. Brown would be pavement areas. So you get a sense of how the surface cover is changing under proposed conditions. Here, the dark lines for the sub. Uh, drainage areas are a little more clearly seen. But again, the, the east-west divide still runs pretty much right through the center of the property as it did before. In fact, it even shifts a little bit more, so there's a little more coming over to the east side of the property. And again, we use the HydroCAD model to evaluate the runoff for different storm events. So if we could go to table, so just minimize that, and go to, on to the next file, the tables, and if we can go to the very last one, I don't know if you can zoom in on that at all. I don't want to do that. Just get, click on this up here, maybe. 26.4 up there? Or go over here, hit the arrow, and... Okay, that works. Okay. Good. Okay, so this is a summary of the results. Can I say one thing? Sure. It was my understanding, and I don't agree with it, but when you did the pre-development runoff, you used the total site, which is 20.5 acres, right? To get all these design yes. points, 
when you did the post, based on what I saw in your summary, you put in there that you'd only use the areas within the clear and grading limits? That was, for, no, that was for the DEP evaluation. Okay. For the town, we under exist and propose, we still use the 20.55. Use the 20.55? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted clarification on that. Right. Okay. So, uh, under existing conditions, for each of the 12 drainage areas, uh, we have a value calculated for the peak runoff for the 100-year storm event and the peak runoff volume. And if we go over to this next set of columns, that's the proposed conditions without control structures, uh, just with the development. Uh, and you can see there's increase uh, in this particular drainage area one in both the peak flow and the volume. So that highlights uh, something where we need to do some management. Um, however, in the second drainage area, because of the way the proposed lots and configurations are showing, there's a decrease in the peak runoff, and there's also a decrease in the volume. So that particular drainage area doesn't require any management uh, structures to be employed. So using that type of approach, we went down through all the different drainage areas to see where there were increases and where there were decreases, and we focused uh, putting in the stormwater controls on the areas where there were increases. So we could uh, knock those down and uh, get to the point where we don't have any uh, increase over the property. Uh, so if we can get to plate one, that will summarize the proposed stormwater controls in a visual manner. And just minimize that because we will be coming back. Plate one, there you go. Okay, so this, this plate just provides a summary of all the proposed stormwater structures. Uh, the field testing, there's a considerable amount of field testing that was done, uh, not only on septic, but also with regard to the stormwater system. We did about 30 test pits were excavated, and we did 16 infiltration tests. Uh, the average infiltration rate was about 22 inches per hour. Uh, which was, is good for infiltration, and all the testing was observed by DEP as well as town personnel. Uh, limiting factors that we found uh, were mentioned already to some extent, but uh, we had to maintain a 100-foot setback for infiltration structures from all the leach fields. So these, these uh, circular type uh, areas around all the leach fields mean we couldn't put an infiltration structure in those type of areas. So that ruled out a lot of area that we could use. Is that uh, a DEP rule? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's good because uh, Dick could actually ask me tonight to ask that question, so now I don't have to ask it. Thank you. Uh, I hope he's paying attention at, at home. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the uh, as indicated, a lot of places where we did testing, there was shallow bedrock. Uh, we need at least five feet of soil in order to uh, consider putting a infiltration structure in a location. So to the, ex the goal was to the extent we could, we wanted to put water back into the ground to uh, simulate the uh, natural current conditions. Uh, and as a result, uh, we were able to put in considerable amount of inf in infiltration, but not nearly enough to get to the point of no increase and runoff from the property. We have a main bank of infiltration chambers up in the north, uh, southwest corner, another bank here that is, which is pulling runoff off of the roads and addressing that. Uh, the infiltration basin is proposed, pulls in runoff from most of the road from the high point down and from some of the front portions of these lots. And then we have some smaller areas uh, to pick up runoff where we can from ro uh, roofs or pavement, uh, driveway pavement. Uh, and all in all, we're proposing about uh, 183 infiltration chambers with all those, uh, those structures. Um, but again, that didn't get us where we needed to be, so one of our other options was to uh, create some detention 
and that was achieved by the use of a detention basin, and then we we're using underground storage chambers or vaults, which are these type of symbols. Uh, in the southeast corner again, and there's a sprinkling of them at various places throughout the property in order to pick up runoff uh, where we can uh, based on the site conditions and where runoff is being generated. All in total, we got about 67 uh, storage chambers proposed as part of the plan. Do the storage chambers actually <coughs> perform as infiltrators or are they just containers and then when you reach a certain level they spill out? And they they uh, have a restricted outflow <coughs> so that water comes into them, it's stored during the peak uh, portions of the storm and it slowly dissipates out over the next day or so. What's the mechanism for that? I mean, how does that work? The water comes in high and so how does it get out? The, and how is it managed, its outflow managed in terms of the time factor? Well, the, the outflow is controlled by the diameter of the, like an, uh, the outlet on the tank. Okay, and where is, is, the, out, and where is the outlet? At the it's bottom the of the tank? tank. So in theory, over the next day or two, that tank will drain and be available for storage for the next storm. So, so going back to the point that Bob was making earlier about possibility of water draining down into the backyards of the of people along Gary. If you've got these storage vaults and these infiltrators which are then releasing out on the other side of the ridge line on the west side, aren't they going right into the backyards? Of no, the the only place we have water coming out of tanks on the west side is or this this set of tanks here. And any uh, and the drainage from those tanks is being uh, routed to a connection to this catch basin at the intersection of uh, Gary and Buttonhook. So and same with these vaults here? These over here? Yes. And the detention basin also goes into those vaults, so when that overflows, that goes into the vaults, and then any overflow goes into the existing stormwater structures on the road. Yeah. <clears throat> for each uh, of the... So, the, 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 I, um, again, trying to get understand the mechanism so we understand it. So the outlet at the bottom of the vaults, are those outlets that are then directed and actually connected to the underground storm system that goes to these, uh, you know, the storm if, water Jerry, basins? Jerry, you could jump the head in. Right? Yeah, is it either pipe or is it going to the ground? I don't understand. Setting up my presentation for me. Okay, if you could go ahead to plate, uh, go to the ground, let's say plate exactly four. Right okay. Min Especially minimize that, Jerry. And go to plate four right here. There's a blue line here that shows these all connected to a, it goes down to this catch basin here. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening there. Okay, this, this particular plate is just provided as an example of a setup for a sto uh, underground storage chamber or fault. Uh, you have, typically have a, a catch basin or some other chamber that accepts the water uh, initially from drains, roof leaders, whatever, and that controls water as it initially leaves there and goes into a pretreatment unit. In this case, uh, that would be a sand, uh, a sand filter. And water would be filtered, and then a low level on that tank would take it into the vault, where it would, uh, as long as the rate was large enough, it would continue to fill up the vault. And there's a small diameter hole at the bottom where it would control the release of the water and it'll get into a larger pipe afterwards which would take it down to a level spreader to lower elevation. But in the example that we were asking about, this would not be a spreader, this would be a a catch basin or a vault in the in the street. It, the, no. it, it, the, yes, it would be. Well, okay, on the, on the so southwest we're asking corner, about here, right. yes, that would go to a catch basin on the street, yes. Um, but that, again, is a typical setup for uh, a ch storage chamber. Uh, mention that that has a sand filter for pretreatment. Uh, the infiltration chambers may have a sand filter as well, or uh, 
the other pretreatment technique we're using is called a Vortec unit. Uh, it's a unit where the water comes in off the side and is forced into a swirling pattern and the uh, particulates and sediment settle out and then the uh, uh, treated water goes into the infiltration chamber through the storage vaults at that point. Uh, I had a, another question. So um, the ones at the southeast corner here and the southwest corner are going down to the um, the catch basins. Correct. But you mentioned in your example there that you've got some going to a spreader. Yes. So where here is there an example of the water being treated and then going out through a spreader? Uh, really I, I can't read at the bottom of that page. I think it says yes, these. What, that's what, what these are. So those are the spreaders. And the reason they're so far downhill because you have to get them to run by gra gravity. Okay. So okay. the spreaders then are only going to the uh, not to the Gary Lane, not they're to pretty much going the other they're way. They're going in the other the direction. In the other direction. Okay. Right. But I, I again, could you do me a favor and put up the previous plan that shows uh, the overall system? Oh, Jerry, uh, where where are you interested? Because in? we've got other plans that just. At a larger Here. scale. Okay, you could put up 1A. But the system on, it seems to me, just for, again, a layperson, the system that you're designing on the left-hand side of the, uh, the, east, the western side of the property is not an infiltration system. It's really a direction system. You're just basically holding the water and basically directing it down to the storm so basins. Surge oh, with management. Surge management. Right. Okay. Well, what they do is they reduce the flow, and right. whenever they do increase the flow of the design points, right. uh, they do a downstream study. So that's what they do. That's why you have each design right. point. You can see whether it's going to be reduced or increased. Right. So wherever it increased, they did a downstream study to demonstrate on have any impacts. So, so what you did in this report. So, but the detention area, these are going to be infiltrators, though. That will infiltrate, this and then if it gets to a certain level, then it will fl uh, flow out. Flow, of yeah, the yeah, boxes you see with the V's are the vaults, and the, the, yeah, the yeah, cross hatch is the infiltrator. Got it. No, I got that. This is a detention basin. Its primary right. function is just to detain water, water. and slowly release it over time. And it, it'll serve in the same capacity as the, the chambers, the storage chambers. Uh, My question, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The overflow, again, for those will we say be directed to the scotch basin and I have some information that right, we've right. looked at that. Okay. So my, my, my question is uh, this array here, the yes. vaults, I don't see where's the water coming from that fills those vaults? Uh, the, I don't see from any about structure this for that. part of the road down to here, these catch basins are being piped reverse gradient back to these vaults. Reverse gradient? Are they? Is is this a force system? A, no, it's, it's just these, these are going to have to deep. be deep. Right. deep. Okay, they're deep enough so yeah. that it does that. Right, so it runs backwards. Okay, got it. And there's no there's no sand filter for that uh, that I see. Probably a sump in that first base. Well, there? I don't see uh, anything. They're all vaults. Yeah, I don't see anything. You may have to add one. And I don't see one here either for this system. Well, that one, there is one, I think, right there. Is there? SF, I see. SF. But that's only for it's, one very, of it's very small compared to the rest of oh, the, the water that's thing. being stored and yeah. retained. Is that typical? Yeah, that, that, that's they're pretty much at scale. That's at the size of the. Uh, so, do they ever get, uh, do, do they ever sort of eventually not do the job? I mean. Well, all of these structures are. I mean, they get the, the, whatever it is they're filtering out, does it sooner or later contaminate the filter itself and it doesn't do the job anymore? Well, again, all the, let me go back to the, the beginning a little bit. All these structures, uh, particularly the pretreatment structures, are designed and intended to treat up to like a, uh, a certain portion of the, the flow and the runoff. Uh, they just don't have the capacity to. Uh, address the peak flows from a 100-year storm event. So they all have bypasses that um, when the flows get too large, the water would go around the pretreatment structures and go straight into either the, the vaults or the infiltration chambers. I'm not, I'm not talking about the peak surge. I'm talking so, about the gradual buildup of sediment yeah, or whatever. And part of the maintenance plan will be to plan. routinely check the, uh, the pretreatment 
units, either the sand filters or the Vortec units, and clean them out uh, as, as needed. Uh, but that's the whole purpose for them, because you don't want that material getting into these other underground okay. structures where it's more difficult so, to maintain. And that will be the responsibility of the HOA to It'll protect it against the degradation, and then you'll have the maintenance plan. It'll be a comprehensive uh, maintenance and inspection program that mm -hmm. Jennifer and I will have Envy will pass the review with the attorneys to go over, which is going to be part of the AO. The only maintenance we're going to have, as far as Jerry's department, is just basically the catch basins and the street, and that's it. So the... Um, the question I have about all that is there, this is a pretty major facility here which is doing a pretty important job which is on this site. Is there, there must be HOA or some kind of easement situation that, how's that addressed? Yeah, it's, um, it's addressed the same way as any other property that has um, stormwater management facilities on it. And there's a standard stormwater management maintenance agreement and easement agreement. So it, it serves two purposes. One, it requires the property owner here, it will be, um, I guess, likely maintained by the HOA. Um, so it will require that entity to perform the maintenance specified in the SWIP. Uh, there's a specific maintenance protocol that's um, that's spelled out in the, the stormwater maintenance plan. Um, and then it also is an easement agreement to allow the town the ability to, if something is going wrong or if the, the owner fails to maintain, it allows the town access to that property to go in and do whatever right. maintenance needs to happen and then charge it back to the property owner. And so these, but these other ones which are really site specific are the property owner's responsibility, is that right? That's my understanding is how it would be structured. Yeah. But the same uh, stormwater maintenance agreement would apply an easement agreement. To each property owner? Yes. Right. Got it. Thanks. Okay. All right. So based on this uh, proposed plan, I already indicated the number of different structures, uh, the storage volume that's being uh, proposed with uh, well, between the infiltration chambers and the vault is about 137,000 cubic feet. Uh, what's required to be stored by the DEP extreme flood requirement is about 86,000. Uh, what's required for the DEP runoff reduction is only about uh, 21,000. So that excess storage between the 86 of the DEP and 137,000 that's being provided is what we needed to do to meet the town requirements of no uh, runoff increase from this property to the adjacent properties or off-site properties. Uh, so if we could go back to table 11, Jerry, hopefully it's, I'll put a tab up at the top somewhere. Tables are down here. It's the very last one again. Thank you. Okay, so this last set of columns here is the proposed conditions now with the control structures. So you can see without the controls, we had a peak runoff of 24.59 CFS. With the controls, uh, we have it down to 0.25 CFS. The volume was uh, without controls was 2.24. With controls, it's down to 0.24. Uh, of interest to note is that from existing <coughs> to proposed with controls, or even without controls, these drainage areas, uh, that should be three there, two, three, four, five, uh, those all align with the property owners, properties along the uh, western side of our site. You can see that uh, across the board for those five, four or five drainage areas, there's relatively significant decrease in the amount of peak runoff as well as volume that's going on to those properties from uh, this, uh, from existing property. to when after after right. your treatment after your plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and then just uh, so as a result, uh, we didn't have any inc total site-wide. Um, you know, when you compare existing to proposed with the controls, we have decrease site-wide. Uh, peak runoff volume, there's a decrease from existing to proposed so site-wide with method requirements. 
couple, two drainage areas had slight increases, and for that reason, uh, town engineer asked us to, to look at that a little bit closer, which we did. Uh, Jerry, if you could find figure four. Not a table, right? Not a table. Figures are right there. Unless you already have a figure tab open at the top. Not a plate. Down thing. here, down here. Oh, you're not looking. <laughs> right there. Well, you're looking at the screen and not the... Yeah. Down, yes, please. That, for that one there, that's good. Oops. This one, the one with the blue. Oops. A little more, a little more. Mm -hmm. Do you use that, uh, these arrows, are right? Okay, down one now. One more. Good, that, that's it. You know, all we were trying to do with this figure is visually summarize what was in that uh, table we were looking at. So, 9.10, which was the 10th drainage area, uh, we had an existing uh, amount of, this is for uh, peak, peak flows, we had an existing amount and a proposed amount, and here you can see there's a little bit of an increase. Same thing with this particular uh, drainage area, drainage area 9, at the design point, a little bit of an increase. So as we start accumulating them in this water course as we go downstream, we then run into the next design point, next drainage area, there's a decrease. So when you start, again, accumulating them at this point, the proposed is less than the existing. So going into this, um, this pond here, uh, the peak runoff under proposed conditions is going to be less than existing, and as we continue on uh, leaving the site from the effects of all the drainage areas, the proposed is uh, reasonably less than the existing. And we also did that along the east side, along Darby, Gary Drive, and here it's more significant. Uh, I think it says about 22 under existing, and I think it's around 10 under proposed. So we've re reduced the peak runoff in this mm -hmm. water about course uh, by about a half. So I, I have a question about um, th this is designed for a certain um, event threshold. I mean, it's, I don't know where it's a 50-year storm. Well, we've, or been, a, we've been talking about 100 years. 100 storm. Year, that's a nice storm. Two eight inches of runoff. Okay, good. So just a, a question about that. This is a 100-year storm is assuming that this all systems are working for the 100-year storm. Beyond that, once the systems are saturated, would you get more, a lot more runoff because you have a lot more impervious surfaces that are now getting into these streams than you would have, than you would have in the existing condition? It depends on the storm event. Right. Well, we only yeah. design to 100. Right. The, 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 just, uh, just a technical 500 year storm, but uh, every guidance and specification and publication does not recommend 500 because it'd be so close for mm -hmm. Everything goes up to. I'm just asking a question yeah. whether yeah. that's. that's I mean, fact. it's probably going to be over. The, no doubt. Well, it'll well, probably be overtaxed. There's nothing yeah, designed well, for probably 500 year storm. I'm not suggesting we design for 500. <laughs> I'm just asking a question. <laughs> yeah, what, what you've probably heard Don't recently. Put this on me. <laughs> what you've probably heard recently. Why are you causing these big storms? <laughs> <laughs> Walk outside right now. <laughs> well, well, even, more, even something worse than that is when you get three inches of rain in a half an hour. Right. So I'm, I'm just. Uh, so what is, the, yeah. what is the nine inches? Is that over a 24 hour That's period? over a 24 hour period. But what you've probably I'm sorry, been go ahead. hearing a lot about recently is with Hurricane Florence and all the rain down in the uh, central east coast uh, and the ground already being saturated. Uh, and yeah, that means that there's going to be more runoff than if the That's fine. ground is not saturated. Understood. Understood. And also uh, when the ground is frozen in the winter. If you happen to get a big rain event in the winter instead of snow, right. uh, it's not going to go in. Okay. 
because the standard of the design is the 100-year storm event. I just have Understood. a couple observations. Uh, in my years with the town, Cary Drive is extremely wet. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, stream flow through that entire road system and septic failures on a, you know, fairly regular basis throughout its history. Uh, when, when you did your stormwater plan, would, it, would there be any difference if you used more of the western side for your drainage points to send more water to the western side because you have a large wetland system below? Yeah, again, we're, would, that, we're, would have that made much of a difference in terms of how much water? I know you're reducing the, your, your post flows, yeah. but because there's an inherent problem already in Gary, could you take more water from the east side and direct it towards the west? No, the west side to the east. West to the west, yeah, right, west to yeah. the other side. Yeah. Right. The, the problem we have is that ridge that goes down, north-south ridge down the center of the property. Okay. Now, we can't get water to flow by gravity up and over the ridge. Well, you the did that down the southwest corner, so we could make it deeper. Except you'd be trenching yeah. through rock to do it. Yeah. I was right. just curious so, because... Yeah, you know, we, that, looked, yeah. we tried to pull yeah. as much from the west side of that central divide as possible based on the grading and, and the positioning of mm -hmm. homes and pavement as possible. And the road width, Bob, is that 24? Is that the standard, standard code is 20 foot plus 3 foot, 3 plus foot three swales. Three. Right. Based on the code, the swales. So if you go down one figure, Jerry? I keep in mind, too, I mean, not that I'm sticking up for the athlete, they, they reduced the flows along that yeah. corridor to begin with by how much? Bill? Well, by half of them. Yeah, I mean, that's what we do. <laughs> so yeah. when the people come out and say they're getting more water, we have a report to roll back on. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And this is similar. The last one was for peak flows. This was for volume. Again, there was a little bit of increase in these drainage areas here. Uh, and a slight increase of 0 0.02 uh, acre feet makes it to the pond. We, we did a calculation up here to, uh, based on the area of the pond, how much that rise, that increase would cause a surface to rise, and it was like three hundredths of a foot. Uh, and then as it goes out of the pond, the other contributing areas, the proposed volume decreases, so that leading, leaving the site and getting into the uh, drainage courses uh, to the north, it's going to be less than existing. Uh, similar along Gary Drive, uh, at the bottom where everything has been accumulated, we got about, I think, uh, looks like about seven tenths of an acre feet uh, less volume going through. Yeah, 2.46 versus 1.16. Okay, so that's uh, over an acre feet. And if you go down one more. <clears throat> And because we are looking to run the discharge from those vaults and uh, the detention basin into that catch basin at the intersection of Gary Drive, which is right here, the catch basin, uh, at the request of the town engineer, we, we looked at the uh, capacity of this 24-inch culvert, which leads from that intersection into the open water course that goes further to the northwest. To do that, we defined the drainage area that contributes runoff to that uh, set of catch basins and to the critical catch basin. And we determined that uh, for the 100-year storm event, the peak flow is 38.3 CFS. Of that, 1.99 CFS was, already, was being contributed by the site already. Uh, and we then calculated the capacity of the 24-inch culvert, and that came out to be 55. Uh, CFS and change. So under existing conditions, uh, the, that culvert has the capacity to accept the runoff from the drainage area that contributes to it. Now, uh, when we look at the amount of water being contributed by those vaults and uh, stormwater devices in the southwest corner, uh, the peak flow, which was identified on table 11, which I'm not going to ask Jerry to go find again, uh, was 0.25 CFS. So right now the site is contributing 1.99 to that catch basin in that culvert. Uh, we're going to be putting in 0.25.
as a peak. So uh, we're confident that we're not going to be overtaxing uh, that particular culvert with this uh, this proposal. Very good. And that uh, pretty much takes care of it. Very okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any thoughts? Comments? Um, I, th I think just bringing it back a bit, you know, the the applicant continues to show a zoning compliant plan. Um, you know, everything um, that they've demonstrated, you know, there's no inconsistencies with the layout. Um, you know, Steve's looking at the trees, Bob is looking at the stormwater. Um, we haven't seen a subdivision like this in a long time. Um, one of the things I wanted to remind the board of is the recreation fee requirement. And I would advise the board that per, um, per both Steve and Bob's concurrence to move this to public hearing. Um, I think that the changes they've made based on the last time you reviewed the plan have much improved the plan. Um, they've managed to um, do what we've asked of them and still keep a majority of the open space and the protected open space, which I think is good. Um, one of the things, um, this is an unlisted action in accordance with CEPRA. You already distributed your notice to be lead agency. So prior to opening the public hearing at your next meeting, you'll have to adopt your determination. Your determination. Mm -hmm. um, I don't foresee there being an issue given all the work that they've done and the presentation they made tonight. So it's really up to you. Okay. Thank you. Bob, any uh, comments? Uh, yes, basically with ST1, <clears throat> I think he provided some clarification on the areas that he used for pre and post. Mm -hmm. But still, I would like further clarification on the report and have a summary table of all the post areas that you have with all the subwater sheds. Okay. We can talk about that. Just so we're confident, I'm confident that we used the same areas for the pre and post. <clears throat> and on ST2, it's the same thing, just for clarification. Um, it's a lot easier if you show all the design points on the routing diagram yep. so we can see exactly where they are. And when you do the summary sheets for that, show the deep side points, I can see where you're getting all those numbers from, okay. which you incorporate into the table. Uh, ST3 basically is just just for clarification so I can track everything and check it a little bit better, but all in all, they've done a <coughs> commendable job. Uh, just give a map with a 1 to 40 piece of maps you provide. It's just so tiny I can't see it. I can't read it too well. Um, ST4, based on the DEC requirements, I think you should just give a better accountability or accounting or bookkeeping of why you can't meet some of the green infrastructure as stated in the DEC manual in Chapter 5. <clears throat> uh, ST5, I don't think you did yet. Uh, on the actual stormwater system and the roadway system, just make sure that it can safely handle a 10-year storm. But keep in mind, uh, it needs safe passage for a 100-year storm event so we know where the overflow would go and it doesn't go down someone's property. Uh, ST6 provides stormwater profiles of all the conveyance system. Uh, ST7 is basically just the East, East of Hudson standard NOI. ST8 obviously needs DEP approval as well, which I'm sure you'll be working on. ST9 and 8 pertains to the maintenance and performance guarantees for the stormwater facilities. NRD1 is basically sightline comments I had uh, with the sightlines I mentioned before when Jerry was giving this presentation. They have to be based on... Uh, Bob, on, uh, you skipped ST10. Would you make the recommendation that we do uh, require the bond, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, RD1 is with the sightline. Uh, keep in mind everything's got to be based on 30 MPH. I uh, have a couple of minor comments on the, <clears throat> on the profiles. Uh, RD4 is the typical road section should show a curtain drain, which may be required if you hit any subsurface water during the roadway construction. And also, too, I don't know if you're going to need it, you may need some guide rail, and if you're going to put guide rail on a town dedicated road, everything's got to be New York State DOT spec. Can't put a whip and guide rail. Basically, after that is utility comments. I think you did a good job on the utility plan. But I think you have to have a little bit more detail on the drainage plan. That's for the town road system. Uh, I think you're still working on the water main, Michael. So keep in mind when you do come in with plans with that, 
Uh, we have to sit down with Jerry to make sure they're all okay before you submit to the county. Um, U3, all the plans should indicate all the existing sewer inverts. Um, the plan should show the 8-inch water main, but I'm sure Michael will do that. Obviously, the water main needs to be approved by the Worcester County. And when you do the work, you'll have to get street opening permits from highway on all the associated roadways. And then I have general comments as well. Um, of course, according to Section 113, the inspection fee, you have to submit a uh, cost estimate to determine the estimated 3% uh, inspection fee. GC2, I was just uh, talking with Jennifer before, there'll be various and sundry easements and agreements they'll need for this because it's going to be a town dedicated roadway. So I highlighted them out. There'll be a lot of work on that to review those. And then GC3 is just general notes. And that's it. Okay. Sabrina, going back to your memo, are you recommending that we look at uh, some sort of park area within the subdivision? I guess that's an option that we have if it's up to three acres. It's an option you have, um, or you can um, settle on a fee in lieu right. of. But is there a recommendation? I, I don't have a recommendation. I, you know, I can tell you we've spent a very long time with the applicant planning the layout of the mm -hmm. subdivision. At this point in time, it really doesn't make sense to try and create a recreational facility on the site. Um, we, I think it may be better served to do a payment in lieu of in this okay. instance. And because the minimum would have to be a three acre. Correct. And that would Correct. be quite a bit disturbance. It's pretty onerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And again, um, I guess your memo agrees with the applicant in connection with the expansion areas that there's only one lot that makes Correct. any sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I Steve, have you question. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just have one question. I think if my memory serves me, I think very, very early on in the application process, an actual preliminary plat was, was filed um, and reviewed by the board. Obviously, the layout has changed since then. And I'm just wondering if the applicant intends to submit a revised preliminary plat for the purposes of the public hearing. I think that that should happen, showing that the new lot layouts. Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, you had comments? Yeah, I just have a few additional comments on uh, open space. Uh, they will be putting in monuments, and I've asked them to provide an example of the tag that will be used, you know, what it will look like. and. You know, they're working on that. I would think that would be helpful for the board to see that. And, Are you uh, okay with the 25-foot? Yeah, uh, 25 foot is what we've recommended 25? on other projects. And you know, I think that seems to work out pretty well. Oh, so the 50 that. will be okay? I mean, my preference would be to do even less than 25, but that might be a little onerous, you know, between people's homes, you know. Like a curb. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I've just seen, you know, just from ex practical experience, it's hard to not see encroachment over time, right? You know, into natural areas and residential properties. When you talk about the flags, you know, little banners that are on springy, springy posts, so that if kids are playing in the backyard and they're tripping over or running over the monuments with these flags attached to them, that they're they're not going to fall and hurt themselves on these flags. They're not going to be sticks. Well, or they're designed to be flush to the ground, and it's a metal tag that sits on top of oh, the post. It sits on top. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't so stand it, up. there should be minimal trip hazard on that. It's primarily a benefit to help educate the homeowner, but also from an enforcement standpoint, if we do have to intervene, it's a way to at least you know track what you can go out and know, point to it. Point to it and say, "What are you doing?" Right, exactly. <laughs> we always, always have those things that we have outside of the used car places that balloons that go up and down. <laughs> that, would, that would probably designate the area pretty well, exactly. Stay away. Just a thought. We had originally recommended a conservation easement for the protected open space and. You know, they've come back and requested that they'd rather do a homeowners association, which I think is fine. I mean, my primary concern, which, you know, Jennifer will work with the applicant, is to make sure that the covenants and restrictions are clearly spelled out that, you know, we had provided some recommendations, you know, from the prior memo of, you know, what should be included in that. So they'll be working on a draft, I guess, of the, the language. Will that be a, a separate that. document from the stormwater management document that will be... Um, 
something that would be filed uh, also? Yes, it would be separate. So for it to be a, a quote unquote conservation easement, it would have to be held either by the town or by a conservation entity, not by the HOA. Um, so the alternative would be a declaration of restrictive covenants that would lay out exactly how that area is supposed to be maintained and what's prohibited there, what's permitted. Um, so it sort of serves this essentially the same, same function, way. just a different mechanism. Different, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and one thing I think would be helpful too, because we see it a lot on when we have site plans come in, and if we haven't looked at it in 10 years, if we could have on the actual individual lots, you know, language that clearly identifies these areas as, you know, yes. protected areas, you know, so that it jumps out for the right. attorneys and the title companies and the, and then for town staff too when they get an application, it's easier to track on that. Yep, would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the other question that came up is they've requested uh, they, they've got a tremendous amount of Norway maples on the property, and so they've requested a, a reduction of 50% for the tree replacement for the invasive trees. And uh, we looked at that, you know, in the field, and I, I'm recommending that that's a good thing. I mean, I think it's reasonable that they're still going to be planting an additional 70, you know, two trees, you know, from the removal of the invasives, but it does... Uh, and reduce a large element of you know Norway maples from you know the site, and I don't know if you know much about Norway maple, but they uh, they pretty much prevent anything else from growing once they get established because they do what's called allopathy, but they send out a chemical inhibitor that prevents other vegetation and other trees from getting established within right. them. So. So, there, so that's a real good advantage in terms of an ecological perspective to promote the diversity. So I actually had a question about that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess we're, is, is this sort of part of an incentive or a reward? Um, what, what would be the end objective in, in granting this, uh, uh, this reduction? Uh, one of the goals, you know, from a pretty much a nationwide standpoint now is we've in it, we're inundated with invasive species. No, I understand that. And so let me be more pointed about the question. In what way? Diversity. Right. So let me ask a more pointed. Mm -hmm. How would this actually motivate someone to take out a Norway maple, which they're probably going to take out anyway because it's in the lot area that they're going to develop? Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why why one needs the incentive to do it. It, it, and it. And it also occurs to me that a replacement tree is a tree which is occupying land mm -hmm. and a um, uh, an area where the Norway maple hopefully wouldn't be able to establish itself because there's a tree there, mm -hmm. uh, whatever kind of tree you want to put, a hickory or whatever it might be. So well, it I seems think it to is me an incentive to, you know, provide them with, you know, I, I mean, I see it as an incentive because they're helping to restore some of the environment. But they're doing it with fewer trees. Well, they're, they're taking the they're Norway maple cutting, out anyway. They're still cutting the, the Norway maples. We're just not requiring that they put back but why you know, not? Same replacement. I, I mean, think, I, I, another. I, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I. They wouldn't have to take. I mean, do you, does the plan require Jerry to take all the 144 out? No, no, you aren't. Let me just ask the question. You aren't going to take out a Norway maple that you don't have to take out for right. the sake. Let me finish right. for the sake of the development, exactly. just so you have to. Out, out of sight of the buffer area, right? Right. You're only going to take them out where you have to take them out anyway. Right. right. No, right. We're taking them out yeah. where we have to. Right. Okay. So. I don't understand why this would be an incentive to do it. Okay. And I mean, it's the first time we've had right. you know, this issue come up, and, and, I, right. and I, I, I like to encourage and promote people to remove invasives. I mean, you are correct, they're taking them out anyway. Here, here's another thing you could yeah. do, though, yeah. another, another idea is, okay, take out the Norway maple you have to take out, and instead of replacing it with the tree, go take another Nor Norway maple out that you don't have to take out, like in these in these finger areas or in the concert, well, not a conservation area, but in the open space areas, or take two out, you know? It, mm -hmm. That would be mm -hmm. maybe a way in which you could get at sure. 
at uh, helping control the population of, of this mm -hmm. invasive species, but to reduce the requirement to put a tree in seems to me is defeating the purpose. Okay. To me, anyway. Her, I, I her, think the way we, we had looked at it, and I had discussed it with, with Steve, it, it was very difficult to get 500 and some odd trees on the site, and it just seemed, it just seemed like overkill to put these in there to replace an invasive tree. We, you know, we were sticking them in the woods just to get them on the site. So it, it seemed to make sense that you know we're you know it's going to be a very dense planting anyway, and it didn't really seem that I mean, you know. And the one aspect, Tom, is we you know we do have the tree bank you know that you know for the deficit that would occur. You know, from my perspective, because they're taking invasives out, I see that as a benefit. So I, I'm not sure that I you know feel that. Are we penalizing them by also requiring them to contribute to the tree bank? I didn't you know, say for that. removing yeah, well, an invasive tree. I Interesting would be perhaps they could get a, a credit mm -hmm. toward the tree bank for whatever shortage they have by taking out, as Tom said, more Norways than they need to, um, you know, because of their their construction activities. I mean, they chose to try to not have to have a deficit, you know, with the right, you know, right. tree bank. Right, so right. balance it, right? I understand. Balance it, but. I, that, you know, that's just the other reason. I mean, we, you know, they, they would have to pay, contribute to the tree bank unless we adopted some other strategy. Well, yeah. every, every, but they aren't the only ones who contribute to the tree right. bank. I mean, right. this is part of our standard, mm -hmm. right, procedure. So mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that I don't understand granting relief on that, at that, at that part of the calculation either. And uh, you, uh, I understand you just said that we're just putting more trees in the forested area anyway, but that one area where you said that you didn't want to put the trees, it was on the northern end of the property, I think, and you said, we don't want to do these. And But I looked at the at the at your tree survey, and unless I'm mistaken, there aren't any trees there right now. So it, it's, I think that we we have a principle of trying to, whenever we take trees out, we try and replace those trees on the property because it's all part of a local sort of habitat condition. Yeah. And in that sense, I think that it would be great to anything that we need to, any trees we need to put in, let's see if we can fit them into the property, even, even if it looks like, gee, that seems like a crazy thing to do, a tree is a tree. At the same time, maybe there's another way to deal with the Norway maples in particular, mm -hmm. which is to say, take out two others right, or whatever the ratio might be. You could just do it by caliber inches. If we take out a 20-inch tree, we could, just, we could just back out that many. But I would not reduce the requirement. If we're going to ask, ask them to put a tree in and not take out another Norway maple, I would make it a, the standard calculation. Okay. Do we have that flexibility, by the way, to, to give credit toward the, uh, the tree bank with elimination of by invasive species? Wait, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think by reducing the required DBH, that's in effect what you're doing mm -hmm. because if the if the, the required right, replacement right. is being reduced, then that unmet replacement tree value mm -hmm. is then getting applied to the to the tree bank fund. Michael, are we permitted to uh, have plantings in unused expansion areas once you build it out? Just no wood, no trees. No trees. Okay. So, so they could could do shrubs uh, mm -hmm. and use the formula for the right. Could help. You know, it's in the code. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I recall, and we walked the site. I mean, it's just uh, very densely populated with uh, Norway maples. It's mm -hmm. just the saplings are just crazy. So I, th so I think if if you give some you know thought to this and uh, tell us you know what you think if okay. this makes any sense. These so, ideas. So for our understanding, is the preference would be not to give them any credit at this point you know, in terms of reduction. You know, well, incentivizing them, different ways. calculate based on the right. total number. Mm -hmm. And then we could look at, you know, in terms of in lieu of maybe tree bank, if, if, look at some kind of formula that if they take out six or eight Norway maples, we give them credit for some, you know, the diameter or something if, like if that. There's, if the objective is, if the objective... Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 so that, that, yeah, that alternative like, scenario, I think we'll just have to double check and see if yeah, that's authorized by the but new if, legislation. But if the objective is to is to control the Norway maples, and let's control them. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe, maybe the option is instead of credit, would just be applied to taking out maples instead. 
That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, but yeah, I don't. Yeah. Right. That's kind of this kind of thing I'm thinking. But they got to work this out. If it makes sense to you guys. Right. Are all my issues. Sense. I'm not sure there's anything in the code that gives, gives us that kind of right. flexibility. That's what that we need to look at. Because I mean, there's there's an express provision that says that you may reduce the total required tree replacement DBH where trees proposed for removal include invasive species such as Norway maples. So that's expressly mm -hmm. included. That this alternative. Um, mechanism. Uh, we'll have to yeah, see if there's any room yeah. there for the I'm sure you have to figure it out. Can it not just be an agreement between the planning board and the applicant that this is what is how this will be treated, even if it's not explicitly stated in the law, in the, in the tree code, as long as the applicant is amenable to the trade off of taking more Norway maples out okay. instead of replacing. Yeah, well, yeah. We'll take a look at it and see if it's possible. Jennifer has a strong preference that we follow the law. Before we leave that one issue, one though. Things um, with tree replacements before that were, you know, where we did right. off offsite screening yes. with the agreement of right. the applicant, right. sort of That's a right. similar yeah, some agreement, yeah. some similar flexibility. But, Steve, if we do that and we eliminate more of these Norway maples, it's going to open up more spaces for the trees that we want to replace. So it would be. Well, Jerry one, said so you know, overbuilt or over, over well, one over of the advantages they could space out the, yeah. the replacement trees exactly yeah. exactly um, so it really is a and to claim those areas that have that we've already mm -hmm. cleared yeah because mm -hmm. that's one concern with Norway maples is that if you don't get the entire root system and then if there's still other trees in close proximity you know it's easy for them to encroach and invade quickly so right and if you plant other new trees it helps compete you know with that uh, one other aspect is we, we have a five-year maintenance and monitoring within the code, and it does give the discretion for the planning board to expand that. And, I, you know, we put in there to recommend a 10-year because right. of the volume of trees, and it's consistent with what we've done on Chapico Crossing and, you know, several other projects where there's, you know, a large number of trees. I think it makes good sense. Right. And same thing with the stormwater, you know, management plan is to, you know, incorporate. Uh, they could eat. Um, I know Bob and I have talked. We prefer to keep them kind of separate plans and bonds, and yeah, you know, but that would be ten years as well. On that. Okay. Makes sense to separate the two. Yes. Okay. So you have different timeline. Yeah. The stormwater is a different, a little bit less. Okay. And and one issue which was an oversight, uh, primarily because Fish and Wildlife Service just really came out with it in 2016, is is the Indiana bat and then you know uh, long-eared bat, you know northern long-eared bat, uh, you know requirements. And what it means for the applicant is that they are restricted on when you know, they can do the tree clearing on the site. They could go through and do you know the studies. It's a phase one study where they'd have to demonstrate that there's you know no known roosting habitat or you know summer foraging but my experience with fish and wildlife <coughs> is almost every site qualifies as foraging habitat so it, even even if they came back and said it's marginal they're still going to recommend the restriction on the tree clearing so my recommendation would be just accept that and Move on. going forward and plan your your development around that so the removal would be limited to uh, the time period Into November first, March thirty first. November to March. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Well, it just it depends on your cycle of you know construction cycle, but yeah. Okay. Great. That's it. Anyone else? Anything? Any questions? I have uh, just one. This is a detail. Um, uh, by the way, the landscape plan, the drawings are really clear, and I especially like the. The, the sort of subdivision plan with all the colors on it. That's great. I'm getting the age where that kind of thing really works for me because <laughs> I just need that kind of help. Well, you do a good job. I have a question about um, about the cul-de-sac, and it's it's there are, there are, are there are there two criteria. One is a a fire access uh, trap circulation thing vehicular thing. And Sabrina, does the other uh, have to do with getting adequate lot frontage around a cul-de-sac? On the one third. Yeah. And one -third so this, this is 85 feet. And that 
probably that means the standards in, in code. Standard right. in code. Okay. Gradient right. to five percent max is for the cul-de-sac which they have. Got it. Now, is um, would there be a problem in? It's it's a pretty big area. I understand it's necessary, but would there be a problem in creating a landscape island in the middle of that? I've seen it done before. You know, we did that at Meadow Hill and. Jerry, DPW, have problems plowing that without destroying the island. And I've learned that after the fact with Meadow, not that they have to do Meadow Hill, but there's another subdivision that just happened, Belay, and um, they may have problems with that, issues with that, with the way they plow it. Staying concentric all the way around, they just go across linearly. <laughs> well, if it's landscape, though, they're... You know, I don't know, it's just... Something you might want to have a look at or get his input on. Okay. Also, potential issue we've seen in the winter and prior things I've done in the winter when you plow, they don't. It, that but what was once a big cul-de-sac shrinks dramatically. It does. With the snow, they're not able to get a No place to put the snow. Yeah, yeah that was Jerry's concern. You can't go across it either, so you're kind of plowing in an awkward motion around right. the circle, around something in the middle. Right. Okay. It's tough in that regard for snow removal. Okay. All right, that's it. Okay. So uh, we have to make our um, determination, and we have to do that, uh, Jennifer, before the next, before, before we open the public hearing. open the public hearing. Next time around. We don't okay. have material to do it tonight. Right, right. So um, we have some work set to do, but when do we want to set up a public hearing here, schedule it? Assuming we want to, I guess we have, we have a, adopt a motion to set up, to schedule a public hearing, but when might that be, Janice? December 4th. The deadline will be November 12th. Is that okay, Jerry and Bill and Michael? Yes. Okay. So is there a motion to schedule a public hearing for this um, uh, application for, what was it, December 4th? Yes. <coughs> Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So we'll see you then. So I'd like to just say one thing here about uh, this whole process, um, which is that there is a um, there's a maxim in uh, my profession, which is it takes a good client for an architect to make a good building. And it seems to me in this process, from my um, participation in it, that the school district has been really terrific in working with us and and with their consultant and I think the product is something that I think we're all going to be proud of. I, f I personally feel very good about it. I don't think that we often have this kind of success. I can point to a few where we have and I think this is going to be one of them. So I'd like to commend you guys in putting together a good product and working with us. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay. We'll see you soon. Okay. We move now to a public hearing. This is a uh, hearing for the Millwood Veterinary Hospital, PC slash 231 Sawmill uh, LLC, an application for a site development plan amendment approval, 231 Sawmill River Road, New York Route 100 in Millwood. Good evening. Good evening, Michael Piccarello, MAP Architects, uh, here representing Dr. Jeremy Tubbs, who uh, unfortunately he has, his, he has lost power this evening in a storm. Could not make it. Um, we we are here um, looking to expand his existing facility. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, expansion would be in the rear of the building, uh, approximately a th 30 by 33 addition, um, a single story addition. Uh, with that, we would be uh, dressing up and adding to the existing building. Uh, it's uh, a flat roof currently. We'd be adding some parapets, uh, so we'll be actually improving the look the overall look and appearance of the building. Um, Do you have a sketch of those? I, I didn't see that in the um, in the materials. If, if the board hasn't already, we oh, should do a motion to open the public hearing. Yes, if, if we you have haven't. It. Did you do that? No. <laughs> Is there a motion to open the public hearing? <laughs> Second. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So. Um, Here's a, uh, a rendering of the front of the building with the proposed parapet on top. Currently, it's a flat roof, um, so we think that will definitely improve the look from the sh from the road of the building. And then um, this is our addition in the rear. Uh, and because of the complicated uh, nature of the existing roof, 
um, this was the best way to uh, achieve um, you know, a positive drainage off of the roof, uh, which to actually not have a parapet on, on the on the back section. Um, but again, uh, the front facade wouldn't change other than the, the metal um, uh, mansard roof on the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. um, the, the biggest, uh, so the uh, the existing lot. Uh, currently is a uh, is, is a paved lot. It's a non-striped lot. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, existing uh, buffer, some screening, on the uh, on the southern side uh, against uh, an existing house or dwelling that's there. Um, the uh, with the proposed addition, we were in a deficit of about three three parking spaces. So um, we went to the zoning board, and, and they, were, they granted us a variance for three parking spaces. So now we'll have um, the, the uh, parking spaces that we proposed plus a handicap space. So we'll actually improve that aspect of, of the site. Uh, Dr. Tubbs actually has a letter from the um, owner of the building next door, which is the Rockies Deli and hardware store owner. Um, they have no, and I apologize, I don't have that letter with me, but they, uh, they, uh, the, the letter basically stated that they had no issues with parking there. Um, but I think you represented in your letter that um, you've never had any real use for that. You always have ample space now for correct. Your, yes, I your, mean, your I, customers, uh, your patients. Whatever. I've never, you know, so in 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 my dealings with them since they've hired me, I have never had a problem in whether it's on a Saturday or it's during the week finding a space. And typically, I find a space right up against the building, so uh, that's that's never been an issue. So the the. the Focus of the the project is the project is really the, the rear of, of the property. Uh, we've been uh, cautious to stay out of the steep slopes. Um, we're looking to avoid you know cutting down trees um, and to, to not affect any of the uh, the neighbors on either side with you know, excessive paving. Um, we, we try to get the project very very simple for him. Um, so again, we're here looking for your, uh, the site plan approval Great. to to begin to move the project forward. Okay, great. Sabrina, you had some uh, comments? Uh, very few comments. Um, a couple notes on the plan. Um, due to the need to obtain a variance, it is considered an unlisted action. You have a neg deck before you, or um, a um, part two EAF and a proposed negative declaration before you for consideration. The applicant has addressed all of my um, questions with the exception of um, identifying the site lighting yeah. on the plan. Correct. Um, other than that, um, they've answered all the questions. Garbage will be emptied, removed two times per week. Um, though he explained to you the variance that was granted regarding the parking. Everything seems to be compliant. There's no steep slopes or wetlands or trees proposed to be removed. So this fits in nicely um, on the site and the additions that they're proposing are compliant with the current code. Uh, get access to the back, back so, so it's interesting. So the um, the existing carding company, which is the same carding company as Rocky's Deli uses, mm -hmm. uh, asked for the, the dumpster to be in the rear of the property mm -hmm. because that's where the, the Rocky's Deli dumpster is currently. So they actually access it from the Rocky's Deli. That's why we actually have a gate on the plans. We're showing a gate access, and that's simply just to be able to screen it off. But essentially, they're going to be accessing it while they're accessing Rocky's Deli. They're just going to drive over and then access Doc, uh, Dr. Tubbs' oh. is, uh, a dumpster. So actually, it's very clean. It's very neat. No one sees it. Uh, they're not generating a ton of garbage anyway because it's, it's, it's a... It's a veterinary hospital, so that they're not generating. Uh, you know, that's why they have a very small dumpster. Well, do you have a separate area then for medical waste that's taken away? Um, that actually is, I believe, taken away from the. I know that from the other veterinary hospitals that we've worked on, that's a, a service that comes by and yeah. takes okay. care of that. That's separate. So that's, yes, this is just regular trash. It's I mean, typical yeah. trash, you know, p papers and you yeah. know, uh, mm -hmm. garbage. Okay. Really, you know. Not really. Jennifer, does there need to be any uh, formal agreement between the, the two property owners if the garbage is going to be accessed through the other property? There really should be. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, there should be just because, I mean, now, it, you know, I'm sure it's amicable now, but, um, you know, 10, 20 years in the future, it, who knows what's going to be on that adjacent property and whether the owner is going to be amenable to allowing garbage truck access to the rear of, 
of the, the vet property. Um, yeah, so there we'll should ask. be some, yeah. yeah, there should be some okay. Okay. agreement in place. I mean, this is, I've been here for like 25 years and Rocky's predates me. Uh, I think Joanne's been there for that that long, and uh, the hospital, Manuel Hospital, yeah. been there for that long. It's pretty stable, right? Yeah, there. yeah, it has yeah. a good business. As far as I, you know, there's, there's but you're, uh, I'm not but, diminishing right. your point. Yeah, right. We can formalize it. I don't plan for the future. Asking to formalize it in some kind of letter that's signed off by both parties, I guess. Yeah, it would be um, a little bit more formal in the uh, form of an easement agreement to be recorded in the in the county clerk's office. Um, okay. Um, we can. Uh, we can explore the, the, the idea that it would be less than that. Um, maybe what we can do is put in the resolution um, uh, that the that access to the dumpster in the rear of the property through the adjacent property will be formalized in a mechanism acceptable to the town attorney's office. Can that be conditional on, so that wouldn't, wouldn't hold up by a, a, as we're entering into the fall? My the concern is something like that could take a while because it's something that we can be, be conditional on a CO or conditional on a CO. Are you comfortable with you that? Some time yeah. to do your work yeah. and get your BP. Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. So even that would hold us up. And again, the, agree the, 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 the agreement's already there. It's a matter of formalizing right. it into a right. case just to satisfy, exactly. to satisfy you. Make sure right? that it's, there's, the protections are there. Got it. So how? So you just you described it may be less formal. How do I? It, so the less formal option would be something that would not be recorded in the county clerk's office, mm -hmm. but instead essentially a license agreement whereby the adjacent property owner allows the vet property to um, to gain access to the dumpster. Um, it, essentially, it's the same language. It's just not recorded against the property. It's not as a as a deed because exactly. you know, that could again okay. begins to you know. You know, for the other person, the other property owner is and now a more heightened. attaching something to yeah. their deed, which may not be. Right. Um, so is that a letter or a, a statement that I should draft or have their attorney draft and get it to you to approve before yes. everyone signs it? Yes. Okay. So How about something written on the plan? A note on the plan? Sure. Not yeah. a bad idea. Access, access is from the yep. adjacent property, even though it's not, I can't compel. Just to bring attention to the... Yeah agreement that you guys look at. And while we're on the topic of things on the plan, I just wanted to, to bring up the site traffic schedule that's on the plan. If if that's going to stay on the plan, we should just make sure that, that the times are accurate. It, there seems to be a couple inconsistencies regarding okay. the start time. So yeah, we, we had emailed you about that, Michael, and you clarified via email. You just need to update the plan with yeah. that. Okay. I just want to make sure that was noted. I'll just that. Uh, what is behind the animal hospital uh, so behind the property or uh, the property, I believe yeah. there's a condominium there's a condominium complex right is that pheasant run pheasant yes run. it is so thank there, you there's actually it goes up a, a big oh, hill there. you cannot so see so this extending out to the back isn't going to impinge on yeah. any Property no, there's. Um, apologies, I don't have a photograph, but basically, the, the, yeah. the yeah. property goes it, it almost goes up. Not, yeah. not straight up, but certainly goes up at a very. That's why it was very important for us to maintain the size of the of the, uh, the addition because I did not want to get into the steep. There was no point um, to get into that steep slopes and to get that. You know, there was, there's no point doing that. So. Good. Okay. Uh, anything else? If not, we have a negative a negative declaration that's been prepared by staff. Um, is there a motion to adopt the neg deck? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then we have before us a draft resolution. Uh, any issues or questions on it? If not, is there oh, well, we'd a... We have to add in a clause about the, uh, the license agreement. agreement. License agreement. The license agreement and Jack to has. update And the, the notes on the, uh, on the, the, on the map, though. So. Oh, and lighting? Or is that already It's already in there? in there, um, but the adjustment of the numbers for the On the, on the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We condition that? Yeah, yep. we can, yeah. Okay. Okay. Just another... another... Oh, she's going to put another note on the plan about the easement. Yep, note yes. on the yes. easement. On the plan as well. Yes, right. Or license, if it's a license. Whatever, it's whatever it's going to be. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, as amended, uh, do we have a motion to adopt the uh, resolution? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're all okay. set. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. So we have a few more minutes to uh, to spare and go through here. By the way, uh, we have uh, next year's schedules here. Uh, 
pleased to announce I'm trying to get it down to like five meetings for the year, but we're we haven't <laughs> quite gotten there. So no meeting in early January, and again just one meeting in September. Trying to uh, head in the right direction. <laughs> Keep working at it. Okay. Well, <laughs> I expect you to do until next they year. give us a raise. <laughs> by God. <laughs> In any event, uh, we have um, uh, additional minutes here that Genesis prepared for us. We have the July 17, 2018 minutes um, to review and uh, or adopt. Does anyone have any changes on the July 17? Uh, I do on the first page because okay. I was absent. On this you were absent. If you were absent, we can't do it then. You weren't, you weren't here in July? I wasn't here. So we can't adopt this right can't now. Can't adopt it. Press the power button again. It says right here, absent. But it doesn't say it on the first page. No, it doesn't say on the front page. You were just absent for that one thing, maybe? No. Otherwise, I would have been noted as coming in late or leaving early. I don't know where I was. But... <laughs> well, we can put that in the minutes. <laughs> Okay, so we can't do that one. You know, I, I must have been absent because I'm not quoted anywhere in here, and I'm, I can't imagine me sitting here for like three hours without saying anything. You guys know me better than that. That would be impossible. <laughs> so that's proof right there. Proof. At no point. Okay, very good. We have the July 31 uh, meeting. I don't have any changes. I've got a couple. Okay. Um, on page 9, line 37, he noted, this is uh, me talking, uh, quoting me, he noted that it was very difficult to find parking space there. This is him talking about mm -hmm. the Chico's and AMP. Now that the, the Chico's had occupied the space. And it, it, it's not always very difficult to find space. It's occasionally difficult to find space. So I just changed very to occasionally. You could do that, Janice. I'd appreciate that. And then on page 10, line 40, Mr. Curley brought the discussion back to the front. Whoa, was that, that was a transformer. <gasps> that was something that blew. Right? Yeah, that's what it sounded like. That's a transformer. Oh, that was a transformer just blowing. Yeah, it, it sounds like it was right there. Oh, yeah. Did that Whoa. one just blow? What, like it had to be, has to be ago? right across the street. Right outside. Yeah. Right outside. Holy cow, that was frightening. Is it on fire? Should we go look? Should we look and see if it's on fire? I'll go look. You're doing... Oh, you're doing... No, she's doing minutes here. Your car's parked out front. It's just good old... If there's a fire, will you tell us? Just leave us we'll get burned to death here. Janice, I give you a ride, but my car's parked out there, too. Yeah, mine's too. Wow. Okay, let's, uh, uh, let's brought the, the discussion back to the front elevation plan. Uh, you could change it to the proposed front elevation period. Mm -hmm. uh, 48, Mr. Curley noted that existing buildings were old but not historical, so he saw no, no real value in the existing architecture. That's a little... Where are you now? I don't think it wasn't the transformer. 48. Why do you think it was? I'm in 48. Sorry, Janice. There's nothing out there. Cars are moving. There's nothing. Well, it may not be a fire. Maybe it's lightning. Thunder. That was close by. Well, you ready? Oh, yep, yeah, I'm ready. Okay. You didn't um, finish while I was gone? What? Did you change no, something in 1948? No, we're trying to now. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay. We're you? not yet. Okay. okay. We're about to do it. Okay. Janice, at the end of the first sentence where it says existing architecture, uh -huh. just insert the phrase, other than it is representative of community context. Representative of what? Community context. Mm -hmm. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. I didn't have any. Okay. As amended, do we have a motion to adopt the minutes of July 31? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the last one we have September 5, uh, minutes of September 5. I have a couple of things. Um, well, a few things, but two of them are points of clarification in statements that I did not make. So I'm going to throw it out there. On page 4, line 9, uh, where Mr. Tung was talking about 
the, you know, the, the grade changes and the need to add an extra, uh, extra bedroom. He said, line nine, as desirable as other units to empty nesters and never nesters, was, wasn't that the point of the desirability of them? Or is my recollection? To the targeted market, maybe? I'd target. rather say targeted market than assume. Yeah, what it was, was yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. And on page five, um, Line 20, and Bob, you're here to make this clarification if it's appropriate. Page, Page five, 5, line 20. The town engineer's memorandum pointed out that the stopping site distance of 47 feet for the townhome driveways, is that what that was referring to? Oh, that was the cars that were coming out of the garages, yes. So I had a little study they had done, and they showed the distance <clears throat> the 47 feet, as I recall. It just wasn't clear to me the way it was written. So should I be adding something? That's up to Bob, but I... Well, you want to add from the garage entrance or exit? From Just to garage. clarify, from so garage garage where it is? Or garage? Yes. From the garage. From the garage. From the garage. Mm -hmm. Would not okay. provide. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And then on page 10, I had a couple of additions of my own. Um, line 21, uh, line 2021, 20, three or six more school children insert likely would not be the make or break numbers. Um, and then in line 23, finding statements and determine whether it was comma, for example, comma, to cap the overall density of the site or to allow for future development in other parts of town. Okay. They may have other reasons why. Mm -hmm. I think I hit them, but, yep, yep. <laughs> but I, they may have other reasons. Okay, any others? All set? Okay. okay, as amended, is there a motion to adopt the minutes of uh, September 5? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And is there a motion to close the meeting? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, well.